<clears throat> Hello and coming. welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 105, RPG Artifacts and Mementos, physical items left over long after the game is done. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone here in the lobby on Twitch. You can join us Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. All right, tonight we are talking about RPG artifacts, and no, we don't mean the various parts of Vecna, but rather things we create during the game or before the game that last long after the game is done. In addition, I've got reviews of the Exotica expansion for the deck building game Eminent Domain and Sanctum, which is a board game version of Diablo. That one's published by Czech Games Edition. We're going to finish off with a bit about Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion and a classic abstract game, Corridor. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We appreciate your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media. I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Well, up first, a comment from Phil Hatfield on our talk about player skill and its impact on game complexity. Playing more variety of games definitely increases one's understanding of games, both in how to play as well as how to interpret things in new games where the rules are not the best. You could say a person becomes a better gamer, but it is only of limited returns. Mm. I still lose many games, even though I've been gaming for 38 years, hobby gaming that is, and I can and often get nominated to do so, read and understand rules better than many younger players, and even some who have been gaming for 20 plus years. It doesn't make me a better gamer than other people, but it does help others understand rules better and gets us playing sooner. Mm -hmm. It has become so common that I figure out how to play and teach games that sometimes when I am playing someone else's game for the first time on a demo night, if the main instructor gets distracted or pulled away, people ask me how to play, even though I am learning the game the first time myself. Been there. I am one who very much still enjoys playing games I learned long ago, even after playing hundreds of different games. Appreciate games for what they are individually. Don't compare them to other games in order to supplant older games. Well, thanks for the detailed comment, Phil. Um, I think Roger would appreciate some of that, especially still enjoying older games back uh, to the original topic. Now, I know Phil is also the person who uh, commented previously when we were talking about games to get rid of about how he's never, ever gotten rid of a game and firmly does not believe in the Jones theory. So he is he is one that, that, that blames us. If you were getting rid of a game, you made a mistake when you purchased that game. So fair enough. Um, I like the bit that Phil just talked about, about how learning new games and mechanics leads to diminishing returns. Now, we alluded to that when we were talking about it, but we just didn't have the right terminology, I think, because we, we this is a better way to word it than what we talked about, because we talked about how you eventually like plateau, and I think diminishing returns is a better way to explain it. All right, well, up next, a couple of comments from Chris Groff. Up first, a comment about dealing with a bad rule book. Some publishers are getting better at it, but I really think all of them should be more responsible for maintaining updated PDF rulebooks online when they need it. We, as customers, shouldn't have to scrounge and crowdsource rules to play your game. Uh, thanks for the comment, Chris, and I agree with this 100%. If you have a PDF rule book, then you really should be keeping it up to date with any official rules or rata and rules changes. This is one section of gaming where the rpg industry is blowing away the board game industry as far as i'm concerned because i get drive through rpg emails every day about um books that have been updated and fixed and spelling errors fixed and new editions and you don't see that for the board game industry at all and they're actually pretty terrible at it 
Also, in my opinion, if you put out a second printing of your game, please include an updated rule book if you know there were rule changes. Or at least, like, give me an errata sheet. Like, even Games Workshop used to be good at that back in the day. When they put out the first Talisman expansion in it was a sheet of errata for the original game. So you bought the adventure, and you're like, oh, I got the adventure, and oh, we've been playing this wrong all along, which was great. I'd love to see more of that. I hate when a game's on, like, fourth, fifth printing, and they haven't done anything to fix something that is a known problem with the game. Uh, and I would say they should be using BGG, even if they don't have their own website infrastructure to manage PDF uh, rule books. Mm. Odds are the BGG reference is going to come up first on a Google search for most gamers anyway. So put your put it there and let uh, people have the act, have access to it. Now, Chris also commented on our topic of games that surprised us. Good topic. I can think of two more that immediately jump to mind which are Blood Bowl, Team Manager, and Everdell. When I first heard they were making a Blood Bowl card game, I had little hope that it would be mm -hmm. anything of substance. Blood Bowl is one of my favorite games, and a lot of that just comes from the personality that that game mm -hmm. has. That alone is kind of hard to explain if you've never played it, but anyone who has knows what I mean. Oh yeah. I had no hope that they'd be able to translate that into a card game. And not only did they pull it off, in some ways they even outdid the original. Blood Bowl Team Manager has depth. Mm -hmm. It's quirky, it's full of hard decisions, and must, like the original, it's got a lot of, per per much like the original, it's got a lot of personality. You root for your team, you feel the gut punch mm -hmm. of flubbing a roll, a ballsy play that pays off is rewarding. So much fun, way more than I ever could have expected. Mm -hmm. Definitely a shock to me. More recently, Everdell has hit kind of hit this spot for me. I had read some reviews, but still wasn't really knowing what to expect. The art is family friendly. The gameplay mix of worker placement and tableau sounded good, but again, not entirely original. I was thinking this would be a good family kind of chill game, but man, was I wrong. This game has teeth and a level of depth that I was not expecting. There is a pretty serious game that again, force you to pay attention and think ahead. There is a good depth of strategy here with what you go after when you play certain card and then pretty much every choice you make is impactful. Hmm. Another really good game that rises far past its presentation. Well, I totally agree with Chris on Blood Bowl Team Manager. That's one that, like, we missed that. When we were doing our, our list of games that surprised us, that totally should have been on there for me. I, I was right there with Chris thinking there's no way this could capture the feel of the board game. In a deck building card game where a single match is down to a few card plays, I'm like, there's no way, but it works. It, it doesn't feel like playing a single game of Blood Bowl, I will admit, but it feels like playing through a Blood Bowl tournament, playing through a, a game with a bunch of other players sitting down and building your team and getting star players after your games. And it, it improving your bench and cards getting hurt and all that plus all the wackiness that chris alludes to that if you haven't played blood bowl you're probably not aware of but things like chainsaw wielding loonies and dwarf steamrollers and things that you don't expect from a fantasy football game but yes definitely strongly recommend that one i'm probably not going to go in and edit the blog post because i'm already up to like 27 games so i don't know if it needs any more but it's definitely a good one if we ever cover the topic again i'm gonna try to throw it on there now everdell that is some high praise the only thing I know about Everdell is it looks beautiful. It comes with like this tree that you put out on the table. And I know um, the Daniels from Everyday Board Games were really raving about it. The one, one of the Daniels actually has two trees. He has the cardboard one that comes with the game and a wooden upgraded one you can get. And I'm like, if you're willing to go out and spend like $50 on a prop that holds your cards, it's got to be a pretty good game. So I got to try Everdell. It's just not one I've had a chance to play myself. Yeah. And I, I got to say, Blood Bowl Team Manager is one that we've talked yeah. about any number of times, but we really need to add to my two play pile uh, mm. as a, you know, again, I'm a huge Blood Bowl uh, lover. Uh, I've never really invested in the, the physical game. Uh, we played, you know, you and I played back way yep. back in the day. Uh, and But I've been a huge fan of the digital ever since. So, Yeah, and actually, we, we may get a chance to check out the third edition of that. Uh, that's something that's in the works. Fingers crossed. Uh, fingers crossed. Yeah, that's digital, not, not, the, not the print game. I, I don't know if Games Workshop even does review copies i never even thought to approach them yeah. they would want painted miniatures in the pictures though and that just i know that's not gonna happen <laughs> but yeah seriously like for all the times you've come down how have we not played this one? Oh, and we've talked about like, it i mean see i know it's been talked about uh between yeah. us it's just never gotten to the table there's always something else all right 
So up next, I think Isaac Kuo has been consuming all things Bellhop lately, <laughs> as we got a number of comments from Isaac all over our content. That sounds like you did a bad up, thing. <laughs> first up on our Vikings unboxing, looks fun and approachable. Now, next on our Breakdancing Meeples unboxing, they commented, I'm disappointed. I was expecting a big meeple where you perform the moves directly. Okay. I guess that would have been more mm, subjective performance art than an actual game. But seriously, I am mad skilled at spinning dice on other things. I don't know anyone else who can spin four-sided dice. I'll admit, I've done it a couple times, but I, I am not skilled. I would not be able to instantly pick up a four-sider and do it, but I have done it. I've had enough board game nights at the club waiting for games to end who uh, managed to learn that one at least a couple times. Well, next, a longer comment from Isaac on Talisman. Suggestions on how to speed it up. Hmm. I do wonder if it might be possible to modify Talisman to be faster via pseudo-simultaneous movement. I mean, instead of waiting for your turn to come around... Everyone takes a turn at the same time. If two players are doing things where it matters whose action takes place first, well, you just work it out among yourselves. Or less chaotically, you simply roll your movement die at the end of your turn rather than the beginning. That way you can actually plan your move while waiting for your turn rather than just waiting and not being able to plan anything in advance. Uh, there's some solid suggestions there from Isaac, though. I don't know. Rolling ahead in Talisman, I don't think would matter much. Because really, you roll and you decide if you go left, right. Like, that's your decision point. That really doesn't take a lot of time. It's, do I grab two cards or do I grab one? Do I go to the, uh, I'm going to use Talisman cards instead of Batman, but do I go to the oasis or the desert and lose a life? Or do I go the other way and encounter the, the person who gives me two life, right? There's not a lot of decisions there. But I do like the simultaneous movement, but that's definitely one where I can see you doing it by being like, oh, no, no, back up, hold on. This would have happened on my turn. But I do think those are some cool ideas. All right, now, finally, Isaac has some comments on game design based on our Roll for Lasers review. All right. That's a thing. Uh, uh, yeah. So that's a thing I ponder as a problem in game design. I want to design a game that is approachable and fun to play. But if you make the decision process too complex, that can suck the fun out of it. Obviously, you need to give players a feeling that they have choices that matter. But too many choices that matter a lot, it can be stressful. The game I'm working on now, Dodeca, is basically Settlers of Catan meets Twilight Imperium light. Trading okay. resources works like Settlers, which gives all the players something to do frequently. You don't have to wait very long until the next trading phase. I also try to minimize time to wait by limiting a player to just one move per turn. This is like activating a destination mm. in Twilight Imperium, but no need to place a counter on it. Generally, this means each turn will only have one combat battle to resolve, if any. Since battles take a while to resolve, it's good to limit how many battles you need to wait through before having something to do. Oh, another mechanism for limiting choices. You buy units, techs, and victory points from a pool, similar to Illuminati. This reduces AP by giving you only a handful of different potential things to buy. Mm. Fundamentally, I want each turn to go by quickly. Maybe not as fast as Settlers, where many turns involve passing while waiting to get some resources. Mm -hmm. In my Dodeca game, you don't really have that situation because there's almost always something you need to do due to limited move abilities and the need to tax a system to collect its resources. And the fact that no one has enough units to truly defend all systems from tax raids. <laughs> oh yeah, you only get to tax one system per turn. That means any sizable empire will have a lot of resources just sitting there enticing others to smash and grab. Well, thanks for all the comments there, Isaac. That's quite a few. Uh, I will say these conversations, some of these conversations are still going on on social media. They branched out from here. Uh, the big thing I think that's important from Isaac's note there, for one, is game sounds like it's going to be pretty cool. Um, Ryan in the chat room was mentioning I should point out Star Affairs of Catan to see if he's played that. Um, but the thing that I think is important that he's mentioning there is is the whole balance right the the learning curve of the game the number of decisions the gameplay speed versus the ease of learning that's a huge part of game design and game impact and actually it's something that's going to come up later in the show when we get to the reviews of uh eminent domain because all of these things factor into game weight 
And to be honest, trying to find that balance is one of the things that makes me not want to design my own game. Like that, that is part of it that scares me. I'm like, I, I don't want to have to try to figure out that that balance of I want a heavy, crunchy game where play that's semi-realistic and a bit of a simulation, but I also want to play fast, right? I don't I don't want to do that math. But what I will say is what I like to see and what I think is important, and it sounds like Isaac's game could use this, is a ramp up. Like, I don't care how many different options there are in the game, as long as you only, a few of them are valid at a time, especially at the beginning of the game, right? Like ramping up with more and more valid options as the game runs. So for a great example of this, check out Anachrony. So Anachrony, when you first see that game, you're going to be intimidated. I was. And I play heavy games like this is this game just blows your brain. You're like, oh, there's way too much going on. But once you sit down to play and you go, well, look, I only have three exosuits the first turn. I can only possibly go to three different places. I can't build anything because I don't have resources yet. And I don't have any new worker placement spots. All I've got are the six spots on the board to go to. Well, if I want to build stuff, I'm going to need resources. And if I want to do stuff, I'm going to need people to do them. And maybe I want to go first player next turn to try to grab some cool building. But like, the, the the smaller subset of the options that are presented to you makes it go by much quicker and it's a lot easier. And I every time I've taught this game by round two, someone will say, wow, okay, this game's a lot less complicated than I thought it was. And everyone else at the table will be on their head. Yeah, yep, uh-huh. And it's awesome. And I love the games that do that. And, and as an example, we were, Isaac's conversation went on with me and he was talking about how settlers throws everything and throws you into the deep water. And I'm like, well, that's only because you learn settlers by someone teaching you settlers of Catan. If you buy it from the box has a simple setup, which makes sure the first game's balanced where everyone's got an eight and the starting roads and settlements are there. Cause his complaint was if you've never played settlers and so I hand you a, a thing and say, put a settlement on the board. You're like, I don't know. Well, if you actually read the rules, there is an intro setup that onboards you by taking away that decision point and giving you your starting resources and going, oh, well, the first one player is going to be able to build a road the first turn. Another player is going to be able to build a settlement the first turn. And that's all predetermined in this setup. Someone else is going to be able to buy a card. And it really does onboard you. But again, they're learning the game through a verbal tradition, which is becoming more and more common with Catan, kind of like the whole Monopoly problem. If people haven't realized that there is a way to learn the game that way. But overall, my point is anyone designing games worry about that worry about the onboarding worry about the number of decisions sure make a hugely complicated game but don't give the players every option as an example of a game that fails at this check out food chain magnet where you can learn that lose the game on the first turn if you make a wrong choice because at the first part of the game you can hire anyone out of all the cards on the table and if you don't happen to get either like the freezer that lets you get pizza for free or the thing that gives you free burgers or you're going to lose because the people that did that are going to start with more food than you. And that's a game that punishes you for not understanding the game the first time you play, which I think is actually a terrible design, despite the fact I like Food Chain Magnet. <laughs> all right. Well, after all that, finally, let's <laughs> leave off with a very positive comment from Monkey Sigs on YouTube in regards to our Shogun actual play. Odd. Thanks for contributing to the hobby, guys. Looks like a fantastic game, and it's appreciated to see a group au natural with a teach and everything. Love it. Oh, thank you. You're very welcome, Monkey Sakes. I, I love reading comments like this. It's glad to see people are appreciating what we're doing. And that's something weird on YouTube lately. Like our older actual plays have suddenly like taken off. I don't know if it's everyone stuck at home, so they're watching other people play games or what it is, but it's kind of cool that people are still discovering some of our older videos. Though the quality on them is probably a little suspect. Though I I do like the fact that they're appreciating that it's not overproduced, right? It's which it's I not. Mean, it's a like camera pointing at the table. We could definitely use a little nicer cam uh, quality camera lighting and things like that. But you don't need to go into the full production with multiple mm. cameras and things. Sometimes just having four people sitting at a table or five people sitting at a table, someone teaching the game and then playing, is really the best way to find out about a game and how it works. And because you don't have the distracting production. Though I do worry about anyone taking our, our videos as learn to plays without any mistakes in them. Well, there is that. <laughs> That's my only <laughs> concern there. Except except for the, the uh, Jaws of the Lion episode one, it was meant to be an actual teach. Or if we specifically say it's a teach, we try. But yeah. me, I, I Shogun, I probably did not mess up. I love that. I've known that game for a long time. And if I have, I've been playing it wrong for like 20 years. <laughs> All right, well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. 
A few quick announcements before we continue. Have you followed us on Facebook? Subscribed on YouTube? Followed on Twitch? Bookmark the website. Just a warning that due to the pandemic, smoke signals and fax notifications are being phased out, and the drum-based text messaging system will be eternally discontinued due to blisters. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email recapping all the content we released the blog uh, the week previous. Sorry. All content we released the week previous, blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, unboxings, etc. You can go sign up by going to tabletopbellhop.com and subscribe right there in the sidebar or go over to newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. All right. Hey, you people in the chat room, those of you listening live, this only matters for you people right now. You folk head over to tabletopbellhop.com. Enter to win Garinto right now. It's a top post. If you haven't done it yet, go now. This giveaway ends at midnight tonight, so it's your last chance. Tune in next week when we'll announce the winner. All right, as of now, all of the written reviews from our review of Palooza are live. We haven't gotten any feedback, positive or negative, on that episode format, and we really could use this feedback. We want to know, did people dig that or not? Is having a review-filled episode something we should consider doing more often? Something will replace some, but not all of our Ask Us Anything episodes. At the end of the month, we'll be returning to ask or answering questions from our chat room in a live end of the month AMA. That's scheduled to hit on September 30th. All right, like minutes before the show went live, we hit a very important milestone, something that has me very excited, very happy, makes me want to crack open the beers while we're recording right now, and that is hitting 1,000 YouTube subscribers. Thank you to every single one of you who took the time to subscribe to our channel. This is an important milestone for us, not only because it's going to let us apply for partner status and possibly earn a bit of money, trust me, a bit from our channel, but more importantly, because this actually unlocks a number of new features on YouTube, features that we can use to improve our content going forward. Right. So it's going to take some time. Again, we do have to apply for the partner status and get approved. Uh, and then we need to learn what all these various features yes. are and, and how to make them work because the ever evolving uh, interface of YouTube is not the mm -hmm. most user friendly, but we're looking forward to getting that chance and you have all made it possible. Yes. Thank you. Everyone who has subbed to your channel. You are all awesome. We're here to answer your game gaming or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on ask the bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions to come to us is through the website, as Sean just mentioned. But we're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere online. Tonight, we've got a topic from the fine folk at Misdirected Mark Gaming Podcast, an excellent RPG roundtable podcast that offers a wide range of advice for people running and playing games. Okay, going way back at this point, I apologize it took us too, this long to get to this topic, but back on episode 358 of the Misdirected Mark Gaming Podcast, the crew talked about RPG artifacts. And what's amusing is I've seen they've now gone and edited the title of that episode to say game-generated RPG artifacts. And what they were talking about were physical things that were created while playing the game. Right, so this is one of those things where we didn't necessarily agree with their definition uh, that they based the episode on. And, and that was, there was some, there was some discussion in the chat room that yep. happened and, and some things. So they, but they asked us to go ahead and try and do it. It's uh, do, do it ourselves. Yep. We'll be sure to drop a link to that episode in the show notes for those of you who want to hear their take on the topic. Yeah. I actually even threw a link in the newsletter. So if anyone got our newsletter earlier today, they could prep before coming because back when that show was recorded, I was there in the chat room and there was a lot of uh, debate over their definition of an artifact. And at one point during the show, one of the hosts basically challenged us that if you think you can do a better job, I want to hear you do it. So that's what we're going to do today. We are going to tackle it. Now, I'm not going to say we're going to do a better job. What we're going to do is we're going to look at artifacts in a different way than they did, right. which is going to include what they talked about, but be a little more all-encompassing, which I think is a better way to look at the topic today. So to start off, what we need to do first is define what we mean by RPG artifacts. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is sort of how their episode got to be where they are and why we're this doing something different is this definition. Yeah, this definition. So so 
first off, when I'm talking about RPG artifacts, I don't mean the Eye of Vecna or the Deck of Many Things, right? We're, we're not talking about in-game mechanical artifacts, like, like the, the things that uh, plus five Holy Avengers and whatever. What we're talking about is physical artifacts. That's why the term artifacts, something physical that's left over once the game you're playing is done. The bits and bobs you can hold on to and go back to for weeks or months or years after you've done playing that game. Now, some of these could just be souvenirs, right? They're the things that are just going to bring back fond memories. Like, oh man, do you remember when? Others may be things that you made and you can reuse over time, like a dungeon or an NPC you've created. Many of these are going to be reminders of things that happened in the past if they're brought into future games. So this might be something where you stop playing for a few months and come back in. So this is gonna be great if you take a break and return. In some cases, it's gonna be the game itself because we're gonna make a permanent change to the game and the game itself becomes an artifact that has changed through play. Right, and now the difference, just so we can compare, for those of you who haven't gone ahead and listened to the Misdirected Art Mark episode, their definition was very, very specific as mm -hmm. things that were created through the mechanics of the game only. So a yes. character sheet that was modified during the game is a game artifact under their definition, but a player handout or a map isn't because that is a pre-generated, not through... Well, it depends. It depends. A modified right. map, maps, maps that change throughout the game <laughs> are, is, are, but this a, is, a... This a is a where direct, the argument came yeah, up. A direct player handout was a, isn't. Yeah, basically it was alluded that the, a map created before the game didn't count, but if you created it while you were playing, it did. And I was like, well, there's still a map that's made for the game. Like, And we kind of got into the date fight right there. So right. Jeff Seuss in our chat room, like, well, again, we'll be checking in with the chat at the end of the topic. But Jeff Seuss has brought up one of the main ones they talked about on their show, which was the map in the quiet year. And that is definitely what they were focusing on with stuff made. But I think there are a lot more to it. I think that mementos and other things, anything that's left over at the end of the game can be considered an artifact. And I don't know, I, I realize they said that they weren't trying to value one more than the other, but it felt like that. It just right. felt like they were giving more impetus to one type of thing. Right. So anyway, we're going to start off with some of the things. So, so we this is a little more free form than our last episode, which was very scripted. This time we're just kind of opening this up for discussion. So if you do have something in the chat, feel free to jump in. And I'm going to talk. start off with stuff that the players create. And the first that Sean already mentioned is character sheets. I don't know a role player that doesn't keep their own character sheets. At least for a while, like maybe they clean out the closet eventually or clean out their basement or clean out the garage and eventually throw them out. But I don't think there's anyone that doesn't keep their characters at the end of the game. Like when I go to a con, I hate it when the DM asks for the character sheets back. And I totally get why they do it. And Phil Vecchion very much pushes that if you're a DM at a con, ask for the character sheets back, especially if it's your own game, if it's a game you're developing, because what people put on those sheets tells you a lot about the design of the sheet and what can be improved. So like when I played with Phil, I actually at one con asked if there's a photocopy around because I want that artifact. I want to bring that character sheet home. And there's a couple reasons for this. One is that memento, right? That reminder that, oh, I remember when I played this character, this character was awesome. But there's more to it than that. What if I ever played again? What if I showed up to the next con and I did this? I show up to the next con and go, hey, you know what? I played Hydro Hackers before. We'll just stick with Phil's game since we're talking about Mr. Rack and Mark tonight anyway. Speaking of which, check out uh, Hydro Hackers on... on um, drive through RPG, very neat hydropunk RPG that Sean and I have both played and enjoyed. So I could show up the next week and I made a really awesome character the first time I thought called Sewer Rat and he had this trench coat that was basically made out of duct tape and he would rip pieces of duct tape up to fix pipes and he had a, he had an, a, a van with Poseidon pointed, painted on the side of it. I love this character. So the next time I played uh, Hydro Hackers, I actually showed up with the character and I asked him, I'm like, if no one else wants to play a plumber, I would love to play this character again. And that was two years later. And Phil was totally cool with it, but someone else wanted to play a plumber, which was fine. I played a different character. But it's that fact that you, and, and there's also part of it for the, the game that ended that you wish never did. And you know that will start up someday again, which usually doesn't actually happen, sorry to say. But there's that aspect of keeping the character sheet as that, that hope <laughs> that you'll get to play it, that character again. Yeah. No, you have I, any add on character sheets? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't, I don't keep as many as you. I, I do occasionally throw them out. Uh, I'm, I'm not the super hoarder, but I mean, I have the rogue that mm. has played in more Warhammer games than I care to uh, admit. Um, 
my my third on Black Fist, who yep. started off as a character for the back of the book uh, adventure, yes. in the, in, and Golden and actually contract. replayed that same adventure as a more advanced character, th- and just went on through many different um, different adventures, and and absolutely, there's uh, I I I'm not one who will fight the you know if they want him back, I totally get that, and I'm I'm happy to again. I don't I'm not the character sheet hoarder. But there are definitely a number of character sheets over the years that I have a mm-hmm. real connection to and, and, and held on to for that memory factor. Uh, right. Or in the case of, you know, my Warhammer, yes, I would absolutely you play again. Yeah, see? <laughs> it's that, that dream that we'll yeah. ever play again. We'll finish Death on the Reek someday in a retirement <laughs> home. So along with that, uh, the character sheets is obviously one thing that the characters create, but along with that, there's more to it for many games. Not necessarily, like sometimes you have a character sheet, you're done, but like there's player notes, right? So notes you take during the game. Um, short stories. I have played many games where character players have written short stories about the game, whether that was extra homework, extracurricular stuff or experience, um, or something they just chose to do on their own. Um, one of the things I used to do when I ran a fourth ed Dungeons and Dragons game is whenever a player missed a session, if they wrote a story about what happened to their character while they were gone, like while the player were gone, while they were out of the group, I would give them full XP for the last session. So that story, background info, ton, some people love their background info and write 12 pages of it before they start to play. That's another artifact. Another one is there are games that create artifacts through play um, that the players create. And a great example of this is the Amber Diceless role-playing game. It would give you more character build points for doing things. So a big part of Amber is tarot. And it, through the tarot, you could talk to each other. So if you had someone else's tarot card, you could contact them. Well, there was actual in-game points if you created a tarot for your character or for the party. And they actually gave you build points for writing stories and creating worlds. Any of that character created, player created stuff is artifacts that can be saved after the game now my rough notes of the innkeeper's name and the name of the town and maybe what our our quest is i'll admit i don't keep most of that stuff like when we finish the hydro hackers i usually have a sheet or two of notes from the campaign I, i usually don't keep that i keep the character sheet but the other stuff it totally depends on what it is like i played ember and i have some artwork i drew for it that i still own uh the first thing that comes to mind for me is actually mechton mechs uh, mm-hmm. We barely ever played the game, but building and designing your mechs and working out, uh, working out some concepts there was such great fun uh, that, you know, it was almost a traveler like experience in, in building mm-hmm. your mech uh, again uh, against the, you know, the traveler experience of character building. Uh, and so I think even though we only ever really played once, maybe yeah, twice, a couple times. Uh, I've still got some mechs, uh, you know, in my, in my mm-hmm. character binder. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, art. Um, I'm not particularly an artist. You're not, you're not going to see me sketching mm-hmm. out a beautiful character sheet. Uh, but I do uh, w- work in 3D and working into things like your char- getting your character art. I've got, mm-hmm. you know, designs I made for character concepts. Even if I never brought them to the table, uh, it was my own visualization process for, for getting into the skin of that character. And I've still got all that art from, mm-hmm. from those characters that I worked on from way back in the day. And something that's even more common nowadays is people commission artwork for absolutely. their characters. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. and that is that's an artifact. Like that, that's a memento. That that's a keepsake. Right. If you get like I commissioned artwork for one of my dad's characters in the game. Now I'll admit it's an online MMO, but I for one of my dad's birthdays, my dad's notoriously hard to buy for. He plays Lord of the Rings online and at the time was playing it six to eight hours a day. Like this is what kept him sane when he retired because he needed something to keep him busy. So he ground in MMOs and he played the same character to the max level in the game without ever being in a party. And I got uh, an artist, Eric Quigley, amazing artwork. I'll try to remember to drop a note to Eric Quigley's work at some drew up his character. And like we have a, it's framed in his room at, um, where he lives so i'm not i don't think i need to say where he lives nope. so, yes where my dad lives there is there is a picture of a dwarf drawn by eric quigley on the wall yeah no absolutely and and especially now when you've got some more uh higher profile rpg stuff happening mm-hmm. uh it's common not only to get player art or commissioned art for your character but now fan. you're also getting into fandom art fan so art, i yeah. mean you know the critters for, on thursday nights there's a lot of fan art out there mm-hmm. for 
critical role. And I'm yeah. sure that there are other RPG uh, actual plays on Twitch that are getting that same kind of, of focus. And, and the fans, mm -hmm. if a fan is creating art for my character, absolutely, that's an artifact of the game. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Though not created in the game. <laughs> So next, just swap it over to the DM side of things. Uh, you got GM side, GM, DM, uh, referee, Hollyhock God, whatever you want to call them. Um, for those games that have a GM role, they're going to have a lot more notes, right? And I think all of those are valid artifacts. You've got like um, the, the, the list of NPC names. You've got lists of places. You've got city names. Um, I used to have index cards for NPCs. I had uh, all of it, all the, the story arcs. The encounters you never use. And the best thing about almost all of this stuff and why I think it's so important to keep these artifacts is so many of them can be reused. Whether it's reusing an entire adventure with a different group of players or just reusing names, places, all of that stuff. And I think every um, game master should have a list of names like that should like you can get them on the web now but if you have your own i like having my own there are i like having recurring npcs i like running my games and i'll bring up a character name and everyone immediately knows the personality of that character because i've used them in multiple worlds whatever whatever the background reason is maybe it breaks uh the fourth wall a bit but i have some key npcs that i like to throw in all my games i think i like to think of it as the whole more cock eternal champion thing but whatever so I, that's that's my my excuse for it but like i have so much stuff and I admit, there's some I should probably throw out, but like world creation and dungeons you've created and starship floor maps and just all that stuff. There's so much stuff, even in improv games. So, for example, the other day we played Runaway Hirelings. I have a list of the eight rooms, nine technically with the, the final room, the eight rooms we went through. And that's a, a memento. I can look back on that and be like, oh, man, what was with us with a thousand? Everything was a thousand. <laughs> Almost every room we had in that game was the room of a thousand this or the room of a thousand that or the tomb of a thousand. We had a lot of tombs. Tombs and thousands was, was kind of a key thing there. But all of that stuff, all the, all the GM prep work, that, that made it to the game and the stuff that didn't because the stuff that didn't make it to the game can be used later. Absolutely. And I mean, this goes for anything. Uh, you know, I, I look at the same sort of thing in my, you know, my real career or my former career of, uh, of working on lighting shows, right? If you're going and you're doing all this prep to put up a giant show, a lot of that stuff is going to be, sometimes you're making, you know, you're building a, an Excel spreadsheet to make your life easier on something. Well, it's still going to make your life easier next time. You just have to change some of the values. Uh, and, and that same thing goes for your lists. One of the, the great things about the internet is sure, you can get a randomized list of anything, mm -hmm. but you lose a lot of personality. So yes, I can get a randomized list of every baby name ever. And mm -hmm. then every surname ever and, and pick my character names from that. But you lose a lot of, of the natural personality of your table when you do that. And so maybe that's a great place to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. But once you've started, you can develop themes and, 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 and directions that for your table, for your worlds that are a little more narrow and not, you know, you're not getting a Bob and an Iliothra you know, mm -hmm. married and living together in the same. And maybe, you know, maybe that is your thing. Maybe that, maybe that's how you'd like to do things. But yep. again, that is make it your thing and, and reusing things can be a great way to get that happen. So getting rid of that random prep stuff you did, whether you used it or not, uh, you know, can really help you in the next game and mm -hmm. speed along your prep. And same thing, just as, as a, a tip, Create these things as you're playing. Like even if you're doing a completely improv game, if you come up with an NPC name on the fly, write it down. And then if you do that, every time you do it, eventually you're going to have a random list of names that sound like names you would use, if that makes sense, instead of sounding like stuff off a random list. Yep. No, absolutely. All right. Moving away from the, the, the DM notes and the player notes, whether those are, are, are character sheets or places or whatever, I want to move on to maps because I think maps specifically stand out as a unique style of artifact. I love gaming maps on every social media platform I've ever been on. I make a collection of them. Um, I find ones other people are sharing and I like to share, save them. I've got a Pinterest board. I love maps, whether that's fantasy, sci-fi, whatever. I, I'm a huge fan of maps. And there are two types, though, that are important here for artifacts, right? There is the created before the game. There is the the 
I sat down and made a dungeon or I went online and I went to Dyson Logos, who's my favorite mapper. And I found one of his maps and I, I keyed it. I, I, uh, seeded the dungeon, right? I did the work or whatever. I, there, there may be beforehand. There, there are games that the DM GM will present while playing. The other side though, would be what more modern games are doing, which is creating styles of maps during play. So first off, looking at the before the game maps, right? You've got your world maps, your dungeon maps, your city maps, your floor plans, your encounter maps. And these can be everything from a detailed gridded map to just a loose drawing with zones on it, right? For a fate style game where you've got like the alley and then you've got the fire escape as another zone and the top rooftops of the building and the street as four different zones. That still counts as a map. Yeah. Or you could have the... Um, the very detailed hex by hex walls, secret doors, rotating rooms reminds you of Bard's Tale style dungeons, right? Like we're talking about all of those made before the game. Yeah. And that includes, you know, handouts from purchased uh, adventures. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're buying scenario X from company Y and it comes with maps for city A, B and C and dungeon D and, you know, sewers Q, those are artifacts. Now, the biggest problem with those artifacts is deciding who gets to collect yes. them and keep them at the end of the game. <laughs> I default to the person running the game since they're doing doing all that work in a way, but uh, it's up to your group. <laughs> now, what's more common nowadays, and it did exist back in the past, so there's the during the game mapping. Now, part of that's going to be your old school D&D thing, right? Way back with Dungeons and Dragons, there used to be player roles. And I don't know how many people are actually aware of this. And I bet you a bunch of modern D&D &D players would be like, oh my God, that's insane if they'd heard about it. But like one of the roles at the table was the caller. And that was the only person who was allowed to touch to the talk to the dungeon master. Yes, I'm serious. There was only one player that was actually allowed to interact with the dungeon master. But another one that's important to our conversation here was the mapper. And that person was in charge of drawing the map because at that time, the dungeon master would only describe what the players see. And it was up to that mapper to interpret it. And the players would never see a map. You would never have the DM draw it ahead of time or put out dungeon tiles or get out the her starts or any of that stuff or have your dwarven forge, right? And if the mapper screwed it up, oh, the players got lost. Like that was a thing back in the day. Play, playing your D&D, &D, your old school D&D &D, was very much like sitting at your computer and playing your text adventure Whereas if you didn't have your grid paper next to you and you weren't paying close attention mm -hmm. to whether or not you went north, south, east, or west, man, you were never getting back out of there again if that you messed oh, yeah. up that one square. <laughs> and all oh, the worst were those like rotating rooms and teleporters and trick rooms. And, oh, yeah. it's some people still enjoy that style of play. I actually don't mind it now and then, but it's like uh, we're going to try this for a while. Yeah. So that's that's the old school during the game. But what's way more popular nowadays is the new school game where a part of the gameplay, a huge part of the gameplay is creating a map before play, which gets the players invested in that map right away, sourcing the entire table to create things. So examples of this is uh, Jeff has mentioned the quiet ear and based on that, we already mentioned hydro hackers is neighborhood creation. And when you start hydro hackers, you start by drawing a straight line and that's main street. And as everyone introduces their character, they have to add something to the map and they draw us and they add something, whether it's, and it has to be something tied to the character, right? So when I did it, I did the auto repair shop, which is where I got my van service. Plus it was an underground plumber. Well, plumbers were like hackers, right? That's where, that's where I got all my plumbing gear and I added that to the map. Another example of this is Iron Edda from the uh, the amazing Tracy Barnett, where you make the hold fast. You make the the Viking uh, village basically before you start playing in the stuff in the, the, the area around it. Um, another example is city building in Dresden Files. When you sit down to play the fate version of Dresden Files, um, you sit there and build a city that you play in, whether it's your version of Windsor or it's a totally made up city you all add buildings and villains and people and movers in it um uh, we mentioned runaway hirelings earlier the list of rooms before we started playing that we had no clue what our eight rooms were going to be you actually come up with them during play and this has become very popular um I, it hasn't really branched into the DD style play i don't see it much where the players are creating the dungeon like even dungeon world doesn't really push uh, for players creating the dungeons, but it's definitely popular where any game where the players should have a home base, right? Any place where the game has a central focus, I think is a brilliant idea to have the players 
create that with the DNA to get them invested. And it makes a fantastic artifact at the end. At the end of the game, here's your neighborhood. Here's your city. Here's your, your thing you built together. Uh, microscope is another example that came up again on, on the podcast. Uh, we've talked about it before in the show mm -hmm. and they, they talked about it during that show. And that's a game where you're build, you're, you're building the world around you uh, as you go, uh, you know, through, yeah. through index cards and slowly shaping the world around you. And that's just, you know, how things go. Uh, you know, blades in the dark is another one where you can really, it's, it's a, you know, you're looking at, or, or all the forged in the dark games, you start with a concept, but as you go, you can build things. You don't need to have your entire city mapped out mm -hmm. in advance. Uh, that's something that can develop through the gameplay as you're developing all the other factions and everything else around you, uh, both through play and through character development. Uh, it's, it's evolving so that the DM doesn't have to know exactly what everything in the city is everywhere in advance. And it's a huge change from the the very old school purchased setting material, like the Forgotten Realms, where every building on the map has already been detailed by someone before you. And a big part of prep was memorizing that area of town the players were going to be in, which again, there's nothing wrong with that style of play. And some people do still dig it. And there is something to be said for exploring someone else's world and having a shared experience of exploring a world that every other player around the world can experience, which is something I do find is lost in these modern games yep. because my game of hydro hackers is going to be nothing like Sean's game of hydro hackers, because we are going to build a totally different neighborhood. We're going to have totally different characters. Our threats are going to be totally different and you lose that shared experience. So it's, it, please don't think that we're put, saying one is better than the other. Yeah. We're just saying they are two different things, but they both create fantastic artifacts. Absolutely. And, and it, to be on, to be fair, they are somewhat uh, shared experiences. They're just a very different shared experience. Well, so if I've, if I've gone through, you know, the Underdark and, and played through that uh, or, you know, a, a set known uh, campaign, uh, especially, you know, D&D &D 4, uh, going through the league play, mm. it's going to be the same. And we are all going to say, oh, how did you handle blah yeah. and something? But there's also the experience of, oh, I had such a great time playing Hydro Hackers. We went this way and this happened. Oh, really cool? Because we went this way and this whole other thing happened. Mm. And, and, and the experience of the differing and, and how your characters who may have been playing the same classes, but because of personalities, things branched, uh, it's an experience of the, the interest of, of the differing of the, of the, the game mm. being so different that is the shared experience in, in a, in a strange way. Yeah. I know we're, I, I don't know if I, that it's shared experience or just game experience it's a shared experience with a theme right but it'd be a totally different setting or story yep like there's no way you tell the same stories nope but again the artifacts created are are the important thing for tonight now right. all the maps we talked about now are are pretty much like what do you think of a map like a fold out map do people know that maps still fold out i don't even know <laughs> if that's still a thing um zoom, zoom but there in. are other types of maps too right like relationship maps and I will always forget, always remember, and I got I to try to find this picture online and post it on Twitter. When we were playing Feng Shui or Feng Shui or however you want to pronounce it, first edition, I had so many interweaving plots with the different factions of the secret society growing that we sat down and put it on a whiteboard with all of the lines and who's connected to where. Like that right there is a map. Now, unfortunately, I put it on a whiteboard, but everyone at the table took a picture. And at the time, that involved getting a camera for some of us because this was not quite the age of <laughs> cell phones. Um, so that that is one, relationship maps or your clue web, right? Like your, your cork board with all the strings or your murder board, whatever you want to go with. Those are just as, as valid, just as other types of maps. It doesn't have to necessarily be a dungeon map. Same thing with the DMs if they use a plot map for their adventure creation instead of well there's lots i'm not going to get into different ways to create adventures but if they do use a plot map for example for for designing their game that becomes an artifact at the end of the game these are the ones that i find are particularly awesome for returning to the game later for that you took a huge break you haven't played in months and you sit down and you're like oh wait a minute what were we doing that's where i find these types of maps are extremely useful Absolutely. Uh, and there's, there's also thing, you know, so many games can buy this, even going back to the older games, when you look at games like uh, Vampire the Masquerade uh, mm -hmm. back in the day, you know, 
trying to figure out the your per, your you know the way you fit into the Camarilla and how your vampire who was you know a Malkav was re- dealing with the you know this other faction over here and this other faction over here and you know all of a sudden they brought in werewolves and so now you've got all these factions and you know these relationship maps are something that you at a certain point you needed to start drawing out yeah. because after a couple of gameplays uh, it would be easy to forget, you know, how things had evolved so that the Malkav was now working with the fairies to overthrow the, you know, loop, the, the Lycan warlord. <laughs> that sounds like a good plot right there. <laughs> Let's start running uh, World of Darkness again. There you go. No, I totally agree. All right, next. Instead of things that, that are written down, right? Like most of these things are things that are drawn, created in some way. I want to talk about some some more physical things, some tangible items that are, that are not just notes on paper. And the first one that came to mind when I was thinking about this was miniatures. Now, whether that be miniatures you bought for the game, which is what most people do, like new ones, like a, a new set of getting a new mini for a character was always a big thing for me. Whenever I play d and I will buy a new miniature not only that, I will not say buy, I will find a miniature to represent that character. I own lots. I will find one of my existing miniatures to be that character. I will paint that miniature and then I will buy dice that match the color of the paint I put on that miniature and I color coordinate it. I will buy the primary die for the game. So that'd be a D20 for, for D&D. And then I will go with like, if it's an archer and uses a bow that uses a D8, I'll also buy like the D8. Or if I'm a wizard, maybe I'll buy like a bunch of D4s for Bless or something like that. So to me, that is an artifact. And I tend to keep those together in a baggie where I have like the miniature and the dice all together. Um, Painting a miniature of your character becomes such a great memento. And again, something that can be used again, if you ever play that character again, or you play another character like it, if it's just, I always play Elven Rangers and I always use the same miniature. That works too. Um, And to go with that is uh, something that's very popular with some groups is the scenery that you create for your game. And um, this, I'm thinking of all the Dwarven Forge stuff, the 3D paper scenery, the, if you watch Critical Role now, they're all about the Dwarven Forge stuff for their games. Um, Whether that's pictures of the awesome scene that was built, or if it's, you're able to actually keep the piece. I, I personally, I love making, what I use is 3D pieces for my games. I haven't made many pieces of scenery, but the ones I did, I am very proud of and I reuse all the time because I'm like, I'm going to bring this out again because it looks awesome. Yeah. Well, I mean, the uh, first thing I think of right now uh, is the pyramid that showed up at Extra Life last year. Um, There was a Warhammer game that went on at Extra Life. And I mean, it was uh, it was a long game. It was was like 12 hours. Yeah, it was about a 12 hour game. But the characters both approached a pyramid and then worked their way down through the levels of the pyramid, which were removed piece by piece, and there was lighting inside of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it was an amazing artifact of a game, and I hope that those people took all the pictures of them of them playing their way through this fantastic monster. I mean, a four foot four foot by four foot base pyramid. I mean, At this least, was, yeah, this was a huge uh, piece. Uh, and he had fully painted uh, Warhammer, uh, you know, demons and things in the base of it mm-hmm. you know, throughout. It was it was an amazing experience. And I would absolutely consider every picture taken of that game to be an artifact. And that's something I would love to see more people do. And one of the, the, the things I, I blew away players by this back in the day, I didn't do it for every session in fourth head D&D, but I was running a special event. It was when the D&D red box came back out. And what I did is I painted up all the miniatures for the characters. This was pre-gens. And what I let the players do when they left is I let them take those miniatures home. I let them, I gave them a D20. They again, painted to match. I, we, we actually, because this was a re-release of the Red Box, we went and got Game Science D20s. Right. We got everyone crayons. They had to color in their dice before they started. And I gave them painted miniatures. They were from like 1978. I managed to find old chivalry and sorcery miniatures for each of the characters, painted them up, and then let the players keep the character sheets, keep the dice, keep the crayons, and keep the minis and take them home. And I've had people come back years later and contact me on Facebook going, Oh, look what I just found. I remember that game. That game was fantastic. And they became such a great artifact for those games. Now, one thing that I don't have any artifacts from, but I wish we did was our early adventures in Cleo Rama. Oh yeah. That <laughs> picture, so. um, but that was literally a game where, I mean, you, you in theory could walk away with an artifact at the end. If you brought your own clay or Lego your into it, 
uh, you, it was a game where you you built things out of play doh, and 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 what you built and how you interacted with your play doh was your character and how the game evolved. Yep. And uh, you know, if you could, at the end of it, you could literally take home your play doh thing and and you mm -hmm. you that you created uh, uh, through the game and for the game. Now to go with the miniatures, of course, there's also the map tiles, right? Or battle maps and stuff. Now, most of the time, this is something a lot of people like to use the dry erase or the wet erase, or they use like the D&D &D dungeon tiles. And then when they're done, you just pick them all up. And I always find that disappointing. Because what happened was when I was running D&D 3.5, a uh, huge long campaign that the characters got up to like uh, like 13th and 14th level, which was huge for us back in the day. I realized that some groups have gone up to 20, 30, 40, whatever, but that was the longest we ever played a DD and d campaign. I had gotten involved with a company called Gaming Paper, and I loved their stuff. It was like um, that brown paper that like butchers use, but it had a grid on it, and it was dirt cheap. Like it, like not ridiculously cheap, but like like five bucks for a roll of this stuff. And it came in rolls and I drew out all of the maps on that. And I loved it because I still have all those. I just rolled them back up. I still have all those maps. And I'll never forget the one time I was playing with twos, um, local gamer who colored the map as we were playing. They, they, they happened. I had, I had extra markers out because there were areas I wanted a fog of war to draw, draw while I was playing live. And they sat there and got a hold of the markers and colored all the orcs' beds. And one of the orcs slept in rainbow sheets. And fair enough. It, it's not like she was overly distracted and not playing the game. So I was perfectly fine with it. Uh, but that is such an artifact. I can go get that map. It's downstairs in my basement. And I can pull it out with all the, the colored beds and colored tables and colored rugs that were drawn on it. And I think that's something you lose when just using like a, a battle map where you, you know, get a Mike Schley map and you print it out and you put it on your table and it's done. And even more so with like World 20, right? Like that's even more ephemeral. There's something to be said for that map you draw at the table that you get to keep at the end. And like, even with like the best you can do is take a picture, right? So even if you're using your, your dungeon tiles or get a picture of it before you put it away and at least you have that memento. Yeah. Yeah. And again, even, even stuff like Gloomhaven, right? Where you're random maps, but you're just setting out, their tiles based on their setting yeah. there there's there's really nothing to take away from that on the the map side there are there are i think artifacts within the gloomhaven that we we, we might get to but yeah uh, the the maps uh aren't part of that really no they're not uh all right moving away from those talking about more physical things are props i don't know how many people i don't know how popular they are how often it happens based on my uh my Twitter stream, it looks like they're getting more popular, especially with cosplayers being involved. But many people over the years have brought props to my games. And many times as a GM, I've created props for the game, whether this be the, you know, tea soaked, put in the oven for a couple minutes map or a puzzle piece or um, uh, we used to use, or there was a candlestick I remember using once as an artifact. There's stuff we picked up at Value Village and resale shops that have ended up in our games as whatever artifacts or treasure chests or whatever. I, all of that stuff, all of those props are, are very obviously artifacts or mementos. Those are things that for one can be reused. Second, they're reminders of the games you've used them in. And fourth, they're just cool bits like bits and bobs. You can have tchotchkes you can have around your house. Absolutely. And there's so many ways. I mean, this can be stuff that people whip up at the table sitting around as something comes up and they, 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 you know, some, there are people who are way more crafty than I am who can, who can, you know, put together things right there at the table or between sessions going home and, and, you know, oh, I made this super awesome thing and I'm going to, my character is not going to be without this from now on. So mm -hmm. I'm going to make the, the wand of whatever, or the staff yep. of this or potion model of this, because it's, it's become such an integral part of my character yep. and I'm going to bring that to the table straight mm -hmm. uh, right on. Uh, this, this is actually something that, uh, you know, I actually have, and I'm not even sure where to put it in here. It's sort of, uh, between what we have now and, and what we got next is, uh, I was playing, I was coming down to play a game of star of star Trek. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I knew, and we had discussed in advance that I was going to play the engineer. Uh, so I went out and I literally purchased six hours of learn to speak in a Scottish accent, uh, audio books. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so that by the time I got down to Windsor, uh, I would be able to play a proper Star Trek engineer with a Scottish accent. Wow. Um, and I've still got, you know, I, you know, if, if I ever need another Scottish character, I've got the, uh, the reference material there to, uh, to build up an accurate 
accent because I didn't want to do this stupid, uh, you know, just well, like what, like what, like I did the last time we were, I was down there streaming <laughs> yeah, my, my, uh, my Australian British accent. Um, but you know, I, I, I had it. I, a, a wow. uh, legitimate, I learned something. Scottish I didn't know accent. Sean did this for that game. Oh yeah. That was one of the most epic games ever. Like we had <laughs> such a good time playing that game. So there, there's one thing on my list, the, the audio uh, the training tools that you download or purchase to improve your performance at the table would be artifacts so if you you well that's actually the let's expand on that a bit more i have bought multiple books on how to prep improv dms um i'm totally blanking on names of these books i like, never unprepared was the prep one but like i own um play unsafe is another one that was all about learning to improv better at the table like those are all artifacts that were between games that affected my ability to play and definitely improved it so i think that's a definitely a valid thing things you have purchased or or created to improve your gameplay absolutely i mean there's so much especially as a dm that can really uh, be purchased or or found or developed um as part of prep not as a specific game but as prep to be a DM, uh, as prep towards your 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 general movement, like learning and concepts mm -hmm. and ideas and building up concepts in the back of your head, not specifically I need this city block for this city, right? But I need to have a better vision of what the cyberpunk community I'm going to be running is going to be. I you know I need yeah. to read this book because it will shape the vision of the city that I'm going to be creating with my mm -hmm. players is just as valid as drawing out a map of a city. Yeah, no, I agree. It's not what I had thought of. So along with the, the props are also the player handouts, right? Any the notes you've created for your players and, and all games, I, you don't seem to see player handouts as often anymore. And I think a lot of that goes towards the fact that most games are more improv based with less prep. So it's hard to do because like you as the, the tenant of player powered by the apocalypse games is play to find out what happens. You can't have those props created ahead of time. And in a way I feel they're losing something because of that, but then they gain a whole other aspect of gameplay and buy in from the players and all that other stuff. So again, I'm not trying to say one's better than the other, but there's just the, the time of player handout. I remember my favorite, my, one, of, one of the best RPG modules ever written is for the Judge Dread role-playing game from Games Workshop, and it's called Slaughter Margin, and it is because of the amount of props in that. Besides the fact they have maps and tokens for every single thing in that module, so you can set up a map instantly at any time for any situation, it's the fact that it had um, one of the big things on Judge Dread is their law master would put out printouts from the which shows when the game was written and when the comics were written but printouts would come off on your bike and it would give you your mission and if you asked more about a perp it would print it off like gave you printouts of all of this stuff in case your players asked for it so you get your mission briefing yes but like the every name that's on that sheet they could ask for more information you would hand them the printout for that every location there was a printout for that every npc that was in the bar where you have the first fight every name there was literally a printout for every single patron of that bar just in case one of the players was like okay i call up headquarters and ask for i forget what you called them that there shows how long it's been <laughs> since i was into judge right scream sheet or whatever give me a scream sheet of whatever uh sean stevens who was at this this bar and you had it to hand to them and it was amazing just the, the sheer amount of props and i know they recently did this and here's an example of modern games doing it the call of cthulhu Whatever the the big Call of Cthulhu, Mask of Nyarlathotep, I think it is. They put out this like deluxe box set that has like stuff, ephemera, like just all these handouts and things to get players more involved. And again, every single one of those, every piece of paper can be an artifact. Yeah, and I, you know what? Anytime you're playing a horror game, um, I this is where you need handouts or. Uh, you need, uh, you know, you're, whether you're building a murder board or whatever clues that you're you're finding. Chill is a is a great example mm -hmm. of a game that I think just demands player handouts. Right, you've got to find that note that was left over in the you know the dirty uh, motel mm -hmm. you went investigating into, or you know things you found checking out a crime scene. Uh, you know, those games really kind of thrive on that sort of thing. Whereas maybe you can justify avoiding it a little more in your fantasy games other than, you know, a few tea stained 
notes here and there. Uh, but when you get into that, that sort of the gritty noir detective uh, uh, genre, it just cries out for, for having that physical thing to link you. Mm -hmm. I think part of it too is the more modern you get, the more you can easily have props right. that fit, right? Yep. Like you can, because you can't hand someone a flaming sword or, <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, the gem of many eyes that glows or whatever. Whereas it's like the handgun looked like this and you hand them a squirt gun, right? <laughs> like, or whatever, whatever the case may be. Right. I think that's part of it. But yeah, I agree totally that, that especially that those gritty noir, the, the more down and dirty the game is, the more it feels like it should have the players touching things. Right. Whereas again, if you move into cyberpunk, uh, you know, your, your cyberpunk games are going to have less of that because your concepts are more digital. You're, they're more ephemeral. They're, mm -hmm. they're, you know, it's, it's a, it's a screen that you're reading rather yes. than that, that physical thing. The only physical things out there are things that are trying, that may be trying to avoid ever being put into mm -hmm. the net. Though I did see an awesome use of modern technology, a Gamma World game, 7th edition Gamma World from Wizards of the Coast. In the middle of the adventure, the characters find a web address and they put it into your phone or whatever. At that time, there were enough people had phones and you watched a video of an alien sneaking around in a garage that gave you a hint to solve the thing. And it was literally, you put it in your code and you could watch the video. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's a pretty cool modern prop. Yeah, no, and I could, I could totally see, um, if I, I, I would actually almost love to be a co-DM on somebody, you know, where, you know, you're just, mm -hmm. you, someone's come up with something and they need something. And it's like, Hey, can you create a video to show this? I'm like, sure. Give me yeah. You know, by next week, I'll give you a video that your players can watch there you sort go. of thing. That could, that could definitely be a fun, uh, definitely a fun be a fun. And then again, you get to keep the video, right? You throw it up on YouTube for Absolutely. everyone else. To you check know, once out. the game's over, there you go. It's there for everyone to see forever. So we're talking about lots of physical props. And I think something that goes with that, they again is growing in popularity, but popular even back when I first started playing in the eighties was costumes. Showing up dressed like your character was a thing. My most famous costume is I have a GM outfit, a, a, a high programmer outfit for when I ran paranoia. I have a set of white robes that I would put on whenever I ran paranoia. And I, that was my high programmer outfit that I wore when I ran it. Now, unfortunately, it ended up in the wash with something black and then they became gray robes. So I no <laughs> longer have that artifact. Plus, I was like 13 at the time and I highly doubt I would fit anything I wore when I was 13. But costumes are definitely a thing. People now cosplay as their characters. But not only that, people cosplay as other people's characters, which that part still blows my mind. Like that was the part to me where I realized that Dungeons and Dragons had reached a new plateau of pop culture is when people started cosplaying as other people's characters. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, you know, Danielle, who's not in our chat room tonight, unfortunately, yep. is, you know, shows up at, at cons in costume and it's awesome. Yep. It's great to see uh, whether that's, you know, whether it's a costume just generic, whether it's a costume for a game she intends to play, has played uh, or or something she doesn't play, but she enjoys and she watches, mm -hmm. you know, whether whether you're a critter watching the critical role stuff or you just happen to like, uh, you know, character X from book X in, in system Y. Um, mm -hmm. That's awesome. And that's great. And and what you have created, what you have put together is an artifact. Definitely. Like those costumes, like I know people have like put their costumes on mannequins and have them displayed in their house. Like it's, it's definitely a thing. Absolutely. All right. Here's some, we're, we're getting near the end. Bear with it. We're a little bit longer than I thought it would take us to get through this, but it's awesome because we come up with some stuff I didn't think of. Here's some stuff that I don't know if people would think of as artifacts that I actually think are, and that, that tend to stay with the group of the game. And now the first one we kind of alluded to, and it kind of goes with the city building, but that's the, the, the stronghold rules for D and D going way back in the day, the, the keep rules or the, the superhero headquarters from Marvel superheroes or the thieves den in Warhammer. Um, the, the, home base the thing the players create and what to me sets these apart from the the group player creation is these are often done independently of the dm these are usually things that are done in the game that the player themselves just sit and do on their own it's, it's like a lonely fun for the players as opposed to the the group creation which is why i want to call them out as something separate yeah absolutely uh i still have the casino that my rogue built uh, and, you know, worked out and, you know, we, we figured out how the casino was going to work and, you know, where the cheating was going to be and where the games were fair <laughs> and, you know, what kind of a profit it would be able to turn in, you know, in given in 
you know, a given period of time. And that was all something that was designed. And I mean, we, we took the Warhammer rules that were there and, and there was some consul consultation with the, the DM, of course, but it was mostly just me sort of coming up with mm -hmm. the cool, you know, retirement uh, initiative for my rogue. Another one. Now, here's where, where things get really abstract, and I think this is a very valid one um, that I don't even know if the Mr. Rack and Mark guys caught. And this is when you create new stuff for the game that will continue when you play the game in the future. So new equipment. Uh, we did talk about making mechs for, for MechCon earlier, so I think that falls into here. Making new gear, new moves. Uh, for anyone who plays Powered by the Apocalypse, lots of people make new moves for their games because they're playing and they find they're missing something, so they create a new move, and then they'll use that move and everyone going forward. A very common one for Dungeons & Dragons that has been around since the 70s is creating new spells. Every version of D&D has had very detailed rules for creating new spells. And once you create those new spells, they're now part of the game. And the game now has those artifacts in them. If you read the first edition D&D, &D, you're not going to find Nistel's Magic Order or Tensor's Floating Disc because Tenso and Nistel hadn't made them yet. But if you look at the AD&D &D book, you're going to find those. And those are artifacts from actual games played with Gary Gygax and his friends. Mike Nistel is the one who made Nistel's Magic Error. Tensor's Floating Disc, I can't remember the name of the, 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 the player. But again, it was a player at the table created that. And how, that is still in the current edition of D&D. &D. So that's an artifact that has made it into the rules and is still there 30 years later, which I think is really cool. But it's just as valid that you were going to make these things for your own game, whether it's a, a new sword, a new item, a magic item. Uh, I'm so stuck in fantasy in my head right now for some of your programs in cyberpunk or yep. a new set of gear or your van you made for Shadowrun or your, your modified T-95 freighter in Star Wars. Uh, and I find, I think, uh, again, I, I haven't delved in a bit and maybe Jeff will... Uh, uh, pop in more on his knowledge of Forge in the Dark stuff, but there's a lot of that sort of creation there in that game uh, and, and not necessarily the moves as much, but with uh, ways of doing things and, and, and directions that your group is going to go into and, and finding new ways to, to build things out and new ways to, to you know find new clocks to, to throw into things and, and advance that just make a whole lot of sense and you incorporate that into the game from then on. Uh, right. I think, I think most of the older players have built spells or, or worked with other people to build spells. I was never a mage, but I was always happy mm. to sit down with the mage and work through to try and balance that new spell they wanted. So mm -hmm. it made sense and, and, and worked within the system. So similar to this, here's another one that is thinking outside the box, but I think is a definite artifact for your group are the house rules you come up with. Every group pretty much and running every game over time develops their own preferred way to play. And that's one of the things that makes role playing games fantastic is that they provide you with the framework and it's up to the group to modify that framework to have the most fun. The house rules for your group are an artifact of your game group and your games. Whatever that happens to be, whether that be the fact you never use encumbrance and you don't use weapon speed modifiers, or the fact that I, I those are the just the two <laughs> obvious house rules that everyone's used for years. Ammo, I don't food, I don't house rule that much. food. You know, that, that's yeah, sort of yeah. Thing. The, the, you've everyone that runs D and D, even three point five or fifth edition, has some weird rule for ammo, whether they track it or not. Or the, the 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 outside game, the fourth rule, fourth wall breaking rules we had, like if you rolled a botch, you had to eat a banana, and that box of the bag of bananas we had, it was not fresh. <laughs> that was that was one of those those that was a house rule. The fact that I described earlier that I had a rule in my fourth ed D and D game that if a player wasn't present, they had to come back the next week, and if they could tell a story of where their character was during that time period and everyone bought it though to be honest if they just had a story we bought it we, we didn't really like push it they got full xp which is honestly it was just a way to, for me to give everyone full xp and not have to worry about players at different levels but it was great because everyone bought into it and i remember going back to props twos again showed up one week with this bronze statue of an androgynous man and that was the boyfriend her health had made met well, she was gone in the Feywild and she had created this bronze statue of him because he died. And she now had this prop to go with her character during downtime. Like that wasn't even part of the game. But any of the house rules, whether it's you get plus two when you do this to all dice explode on a three, whatever they happen to be, those are artifacts. That is something that 
goes beyond the game. It, it exists after you're done. Anytime you sit down to play a new game with someone during session zero, you should always be asking, do you have any house rules? Is there anything you do that's specific to your group that's not covered by the rule book? And those things are artifacts that are going to carry over from game to game. And they're very much usually created dr during play. Now, some people I know like the house rule before they start playing. Personally, I, we've shared my opinion on that before. I always say play by the real rules first, except Batman. We talked about that last week. So I actually uh, consider in this, when we get into house rules, this actually creates uh, an artifact out of your player guide in some cases. Yeah. Uh, I would consider my to a second ed player's guide an artifact because it was, you know, it was where a lot of rules, notes and things got jotted down. You know, you, it's got an index, but it was never really the index you wanted. So you'd have notes scrawled in all the margins and, <laughs> you know, your, your, your player's guides, both for Warhammer and second ed back in the day were heavily marked up for quick reference for things. Now we've moved on to now uh, where player cards are a, a thing now where a lot of that would probably have been uh, either done in cards or index cards or whatever. But back in the day, it was that in that book, right? That, that, that guide was your, yeah. your workbook. At least for you. I don't know. I, I find people that write in their books insane. <laughs> I don't have any notes in any of my books. <laughs> All of my host rules are on pieces of paper. No, I, I did not. I am not one to draw in my books, but I know other people have. Yeah. It's, it's, I can't do it. I don't know. I can't draw <laughs> in my books. The fourth ed, uh, player's handbook, and Dungeon master's guide. I taped in the erratas, but they're taped and you can actually take them out. Like the, I used a certain tape that could come off. I, I refuse to draw in my books, but that's, I can get it. Like uh, what you would find in mine is lots of loose sheets of paper shoved in different places. And that, that would be my, no, we fix this. We fix that. Uh, All right. We have spent uh, the entire episode today talking about role-playing games. And I was considering calling this tabletop artifacts and mementos, but really there's, this is definitely more of an RPG thing, but there is an aspect of this to some board games. Now, part of it's going to be your house rules. If you do house rule your games, again, I am very much against house ruling most board games, but it does happen now and then. Um, in general, we just stick to the rules as written. But if you do house rule your game, that is definitely an artifact that that sheet of paper you threw in your copy of Batman Talisman Super Villains Edition that says shuffle deck two and three together before playing that there's an artifact for you. <laughs> um, but there are games that specifically do create artifacts by the end of them and the biggest example of course and i think most people are see where this is going are legacy games starting in particular with risk legacy because you played 10 to 15 games of risk legacy before reaching the end of the story and when you were done you could then continue to play your own unique board forever you literally created a unique risk legacy board at the end of the game that would be different from every other person's in the world which i that blew me away that is what got me to buy risk legacy despite really hating risk and i gotta say it's a much better version of risk too like that that wasn't the only thing but that's what got me to buy it and the fact that that exists and i've seen people with their risk legacy uh boards mounted on walls like people have saved them and mounted them on the wall no absolutely I, and another example of that, of course, is Pandemic Legacy. But then Pandemic Legacy, you can't keep playing. But you still have that artifact. You still have the, the board with all its stickers on it. And you've got the stuff you unlocked. I really don't want to spoil anything. You've got the characters that have their scars and their, their things on it. You have physical. I still have my copy of Pandemic Legacy. And there's no reason. Like, I, there's, I can't play it again. I can't use it. Maybe I could take the bits out of and use it for something else. It's not like you can carry over anything to Risk Legacy 2, which is kind of sad. There should be at least something. Um, another example of this, though, that aren't Legacy games, or it's a Gloomhaven. We'll, we'll stick to Legacy games for a second in Gloomhaven. You are putting stickers on the board. You are leveling up your characters. You are modifying your deck. If you were me, you're ripping up cards. There are cards that are supposed to be removed from the game. I literally ripped them up. My copy of Gloomhaven isn't going to look like anyone else's copy of Gloomhaven by the time I'm done with it. Uh, and as well, uh, one thing we've talked about in the past, the Daniels uh, will take games that they are no longer using uh, and maybe have become, you know, destroyed through, uh, through play, legacy games, and take that box cover art and turn that into wall art, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, a, a, an artifact of... The fact that, you know, you've beaten this game, you've you've achieved everything you can, and now yep. it's up there on the wall to remind you of that. To remind you, very fair. 
Now, other games that do somewhat like it are um, like the, the Hogwarts battle. The fact that you are opening boxes and expanding the game. So by the time you're done, now I'll admit it's it's a little bit of a different artifact because by the time you're done, your box is going to be the same as everyone else's because we will have unlocked everything. But from game one to game two, your box is going to be different from someone else's. And once you've opened box three, it's changed. And then there's another one um, that is the, uh, I'm drawing a blank, Fab Fabled series. So the way the Fabled series of games works is you start off with a deck of cards, you play a game, and then more cards. And then after you play that game, you add more cards. And I don't actually own any of these to know if by the end, everyone has the same deck or if there's branching paths where you'd add different cards. But at the end of the game, you have this deck of that game that's going to be different from where you start. No, absolutely. And uh, then Deanna pointed out one that I totally didn't think of, and that's the, the Detroit exit game. When you finish an exit game, you have all the bits left over. You've got stuff. Now, interestingly, some of these I've now found give you something that will continue on after the game that you get to keep and have, and that's kind of cool. Again, I don't want to spoil anything, so you'd have to play a couple of them to see these. Um, I, that w no, I don't want to even give that away. <laughs> Just because we've only played three, and people could probably figure out which one it was in. Right. Uh, but you get something. But besides the, the something you can keep playing with, you've got all the stuff. And my kids love that stuff. They love the the unusual objects. They have those and they play with them and they have the codes and they've used them to make their own games. And they have the, the booklets with all the different funky art and puzzles on them. And they use those for things. And uh, there was a thing we had to make in the last game that my daughter absolutely wanted to keep. Sean seen the picture of that thing. Yep. Like they're, 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 there's bits left over from that game that's going to always remind us. And the cool thing that they put in Here's one for board games I just thought of that, that isn't on our list is there's a score sheet and that, that I don't care about it much, but I know some people very much do on the back of every exit game is a score sheet and we could keep that and that would become an artifact of our play. And the same is true of score sheets in any game. And I know people who have kept score sheets from Scrabble in the end to keep their high score. Like, I know it's a thing. It's not something I ever cared about. When I get the pad of score sheets, I just tear off the top one, throw it out and keep playing. But I know people who like keep the pad and keep every game ever played in their box of the game so they can look back through their score sheets and be like, oh, I remember the time Dave got 56 points or I remember that game with Steve. So that is definitely an artifact of board games that I hadn't thought of is, is score sheets. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and similar to score sheets, keep it in the box. Uh, I, Deanna brought this up in the chat room, play logs. Uh, again, it's not something you do, but there are a number of people who keep track of, you know, who they've played with mm -hmm. uh, in a box. So everyone who's played this game will be there on a sheet stuck inside the box or you know, written on uh, done with the box topping inside the box lid. And, you know, that's, that is absolutely an artifact mm -hmm. in that game uh, recording who has been involved with your, your plays of it. Well, that's all the gaming artifacts we could think of. We're going to head over to Lobby now and see if anyone in the chat room has anything to add. All so, right, I saw a lot of good things in the a, chat. Absolutely. One thing, uh, board games, just since we, we, we finished on board games, if we keep on board games, uh, blank cards in, in games to add your own uh, your own cards into. Yeah. It's not a, not a super common thing, but there's plenty out there uh, which give you the uh, the option to add your you know, write your own rules or write your own or are cards. those in there to write your own things or to replace any cards you may have missed because i thought that may go missing well i, I think, always thought they were there to replace missing components i think it's changed i think originally absolutely in older games they don't want you changing their game but yeah. newer games are a little more open to uh allow, i'll admit i've never done game. it yeah i have never done it now race for the galaxy game we talk about much on the show and aspect never talked about is they always include cards and they've got the icons on them so you just have to like write the text and stuff right they've always included that that's not it's, it, i don't know that's never been anything i've ever i told you i don't want to design games i guess <laughs> i guess even designing a component see i'm thinking like anachrony it has extra little triangles and i had to take one because i lost one with a mech on it and that's all i used it for right but yeah making your own cards making your own components for a game same you know what i there's more for board gaming if you make a box insert whether you purchase one, I guess that's an artifact. But if you make one yourself, like that's definitely you did. Or if you upgrade the components, if you go and 3D print or you paint the miniatures, 
totally all any of those upgrades you do for your board games are artifacts that are going to stick with that game for all future plays absolutely artifact just seems weird to call it that but board game <laughs> upgrades I, I, I it's a weird use of the word but i think it totally counts board game bling yeah yeah i mean your your clays that you you went out and bought specially yeah. for this game because you play it so often and you couldn't couldn't deal with whatever chips or chits they had, had paper money, money that it had oh yes. god don't even yeah not even <laughs> But uh, into you know, the paper money, whatever, whatever you've done to, to bring your game to that next level, um, because you enjoy it so much, you know, to, to show that, to bring your love of it. And, you know, with the people who, yep. the people who are really, who have the money and love terraforming Mars, you go to that, that 3d printed, mm -hmm. uh, tiles and stuff like that. You know, another one too, it goes with house rules is, um, when you create your own scenarios, which again, I don't do it, but like there are a lot of people out there, like Hogwarts we were just talking about. There are people who have made all kinds of new scenarios for Hogwarts Battle. There are all kinds of people who have made new Gloomhaven scenarios, fan-created scenarios, um, adventures. Same, going back to RPGs too. Go on the DMs Guild and look at the number of people publishing third-party D&D modules nowadays. It blows me away. Well, I mean, we but, talked about in, in our Jaws of, Gloomhaven uh, Jaws of Gloomhaven review, the uh, Jaws of Lion Gloomhaven review, yes. uh, how the... the fan created content from gloomhaven became part of jaws of the lion yeah. um and fan created games sometimes become games right like someone took scythe and made a kid's version based on my little pony that was taken up by stone Meyer games who rethemed it to my little scythe right but he took this my little pony game and turned it over like that is definitely a thing like if you make or make your own game that's definitely going to be an artifact of your game <laughs> i guess that's a little too blatant at that point but i'm just saying anything you make to enhance the game or add to it again painting miniatures adding to it that is definitely something we didn't think of yep no absolutely uh but yeah filling out the blank cards that's a good one uh uh Arkham Horror had a Jeff saying had a pretty strong community creating fan created character cards or great yep. old one cards. I mean, realistically, any game you go to on BGG has got something Most, yeah. in the files of, of player of player themes. And I mean, sometimes it might be as simple as, "Hey, I didn't have anyone to play this game with, so I developed this solo version of the there game." There are a lot of those. Yeah. There's a lot of that. Um, now, I, I would say that might not be. You know, the artifact wise, that's that person's artifact, even if that's I take that it person. on. Yeah. But again, it's it is an artifact, even if it's not my artifact, it's theirs. Uh for for board games. Uh Jeff notes the one player who writes notes constantly in a journal about the game. That's an artifact. We did mention player notes, but specifically a journal or game journal definitely counts, as well as a, a, a the DM's notebook. Yep. I also yep. think definitely counts. Um, published module filled with sticky notes for changes and comments. Again, same deal we talked about for rule books. But yeah, your published module. The thing is, I don't know how many people keep those. Right. Like that only becomes an artifact if you keep it, right? right. If, if, if you then put that module back and you put all your sticky notes in it, comments in it, or if you're a maniac like Sean and actually write in the module, <laughs> then you get an artifact. Yes, it is. I didn't know Sean is, wrote in his books. It has been know. pointed out that I am a savage because I wow. write in my RPG books. Wow. Uh, Yep. You and Dyson Logos. Dyson Logos like adds new pictures to the monster manual and everything. I, I, I don't know. I can't do it. I can't do it. I, I have a great respect for books, but I consider oh, it's, it's but, a I, but I consider I, I, a like a player's guide to be the same as you know those university books that I had to take notes in. Yeah. Um, no, no, it's so. it's a tool. It, I totally get it. I just can't do it. Yeah. I'd have to buy a second copy. I own second copies of I, most of like the players' handbooks. I, I think I, I even own second copies of the players' and handbook. And I never drew in any but, of them. Yeah. So Jeff for Dungeon Crawl Classics has his stack of dead peasants from yeah. various public games. See, that's that's something to be proud of. I, <laughs> I would have that. Like I would put that somewhere with, and I'd have like a tombstone that yeah, says yeah. like dead punt characters from funnels or something, and put it on top to intimidate the players. One of the ones I always wanted to do for Dungeon Crawl Classics is um marks which is actually carryover from, it's actually from a different RPG. Um, oh, what is it called? Hackmaster, where, where you're supposed to be proud of the TPK and you're supposed to put kill marks on your DM screen. I've been really tempted to do that. And, and D's saying she doesn't even write in her university books, but I, I wrote in my university books no, and I, I still have them. That. And they are, as far as I'm concerned, artifacts. artifacts. Yeah, uh, They are artifacts of my university career. Uh, and in many cases, they are actually, because of, because I went to school for theater technical production, they are actually reference books that I still refer yes. to. Um, yeah, reference books are definitely I, are, is a thing. Um, 
No, Ryan, I didn't poison anything. Yes, there were lead in those miniatures, but they were primed. <laughs> Once you prime the miniatures, you're not eating. Unless, unless they take them home and eat them. Yeah, unless they're no chewing would, on them. Unless they're chewing on them. Those are perfectly safe miniatures. They are not only primed, they were sealed with Tester's dull coat because I wanted the paint jobs to last. They actually turned out really good. Like, like you're looking at 1978 miniatures with like a y2k paint job like I, I tried my hardest on these i think they turned out fantastic for how blobby the miniatures were and dave is pointing out a, a really sort of uh interesting and, and almost problematic thing with modern art role playing especially in this particular year where most of our on, our role playing is online and even yeah, our board game playing is online where unless you remember to screenshot um mm -hmm. you know or chat log you, you you don't really have a lot to consider an artifact. No, it's um, true. Unless, and we didn't really go into this, you record actual plays. Yeah. Uh, which an actual play is an artifact for everyone involved. Yeah, because actual plays can be a few things, right? It can be your momentum. It can also be your reminder, your what happened last. Yep. It can be a teaching tool, especially when you go into board games, how to play different games. Actual plays are definitely now, they're a modern RPG artifact yep. or a gaming artifact in general. Yeah. And that's that you don't even necessarily have to uh, broadcast and stream your your actual no, you play. Don't. You nope. can, you know, you, there's no reason you can't record it for your own group. Um, you know, a lot of people aren't comfortable out there streaming mm -hmm. things. And I totally, uh, totally uh, understand that. But that doesn't mean you can't record it for within your own use. Jeff's talking about using blank business cards and index cards. So that was another pro tip from Phil Vecchione was collect all the index cards, give everyone index cards and collect them at the end and keep them as, yeah. as again, mementos, but also as reminders, mostly as reminders. Um, we're talking a bit about. Yeah. I and I think I, I, I actually had, had never uh, index cards. Yes. But I, uh, they were yeah, talking in the chat cards. about using blank business cards and I'd never actually done that. Jeff, smaller. Jeff points out that they're great for clocks for, uh, for blades and forge in the dark makes and that's sense. actually really makes a whole lot of sense for uh, for clocks so ryan's asking when you choose to strip something out physically or do those remove things become artifacts themselves or only the customized set or document it would depend right like uh, like the physical artifact is how you did it like if you're writing in your rule book and crossing things off, your rule book's a thing but if you're making notes on in your dm guidebook of i'm removing this um, as for removing something physically, like I've never done it in a board game. If I play in a board game and there's an aspect I don't like, I just keep it in the box and don't leave it there. That mostly happens with expansions, but it's not often I'd throw it out. And I guess, um, I technically for a while kept all my expansion boxes. Those were artifacts, I guess, to remind me that I had the expansions. I, I don't have, I never had an attachment to them. So I eventually recycled them all. But if I had taken those and put them into wall art, yeah, it might mean something. Yeah. I, I, I had never even considered the wall art. I, I expect when I got rid of all the DC uh, deck builder uh, boxes that I'd collected, because again, they were just, they were all compiled into that one, uh, that one box. So I didn't need any of them. Or it's not being an artifact, I guess it was, it was, yeah. Yeah. No, I Hogwarts, not being... Hogwarts, I think is, is, I mean, I suppose it if, doesn't you kept, change. if you There's kept no the deck made. boxes, those would be artifacts, but yeah. I don't know why you would. Cause they were just playing. No, that's fair. Playing card boxes. Fair enough. Okay, I got one wrong. <laughs> Pokemon Splendor. People are talking about Splendor. Hey, math guy, Dave. <laughs> recorded as a pilot. A lot of people yeah. recorded their games before podcasting was popular. Yep. Um, uh, a lot of people would put out uh, like a little pocket recorder in the table. That was a great GM tip, to be honest. So you could listen to yourself afterwards because, oh, is it cringeworthy? You're like, oh, geez, <laughs> did I really do that? But at the hey, same Danielle, time, it's also, you, you missed the awesome RPG topic tonight. But it's the same, at the same time, even if even if you're cringing at your voice or, uh, you know, what you said that time, it's you're, it's going to be way more accurate for what actually happened mm -hmm. than any notes you're going to be taking. Um, there's a reason why a lot of students record there are professors in university. <laughs> it's yep. a great way to take notes. Yeah, it's a good way to take notes. But yeah, that's that's totally a valid thing. I've never done it. I, I've been tempted. Now that we do this, I should be more comfortable with it, but I don't know. Things well, and I think a RPGs. lot of it is there are a lot of people out there who aren't comfortable. And so make, making sure you, you've got to go through and do that whole extra aspect of session zero yeah. to make sure people are, are comfortable with that, that level of recording.
Up next, we take a look at Sanctum from Czech Edition Ga Games Editions, a board game that attempts to recreate the demon-killing, loot-collecting feel of video games like Diablo. We need to thank CGE for providing us with a review copy of Sanctum. We need to change that intro. I did it for the last episode. I forgot about it last time because if we record these for YouTube, thank you for watching. Hit that subscribe and the bell button. Uh, we should be saying, like, tonight we're talking about, but we'll yeah. fix that next time. Uh, Sanctum was designed by Philippe Neduc and features artwork from Usi Kus, OJ Herdena, Jakob Politzer, Frangishek Sedlichuk, and it was released in Gen Con 2019 by Czech Games Edition. We did our best with those pronunciations. Apologies yes. if any of them didn't quite come out right. Those are some uh, very non-English names. Yeah, they were all in Czech and um, with lots of accents on them and, and yeah. way, way too, uh, not way too many vowels when I look at them, but lots, lots of interesting ones. So yeah. I do apologize if I pronounce those long. I tried to, to do the best I could. Far more accents than we're used to in, our, in the English yes. language. Well, to see with your own eyes what you get with this board game version of Diablo with the numbers filed off, be <laughs> sure to check out our unboxing video on YouTube. For a full list of components, you can also check out the blog version of this review. Uh, for this podcast, though, I'm just going to highlight a few things that stood out. First off, I do have to call it the miniatures in this game. These are amazingly detailed in great dynamic poses. That's something I love seeing on modern miniatures. Or it's just not people in these like flat poses. These are actually better than some of the miniatures I've seen in miniature war games. And to be honest, they don't need to be in this box at all. Like They're just there to look pretty. You could have just been moving people and meeple, and it still would have worked. Yeah, it's definitely cool that they stepped up and went to that next level with the mini uh, minis, even though they could have easily just used little wood bit, little wood bits. Now, next, I want to call to attention the awesome artwork. Like overall, it's great and it's really cool. The characters look nice. It's a fairy themed game, but I was really impressed in this because there are a ton of cards, and on every card is a piece of equipment, and everyone has a unique piece of art. So I bet some of it doesn't change much. It's like the feather on the hat change, but still it's a great touch that every single piece is unique because this is a game about collecting equipment. And I also want to call out the design, just the iconography, the color coding, how easy to see everything is from across the board, which actually enhances the gameplay. Yeah, it's not just a sword is a sword is a sword is a sword. Now, everything, everything else is great. Uh, thick cardboard, easy to use player boards, nice clear plastic uh, tokens in red and blue for tracking stamina and focus. Are really nice, actually. Nice, clear um, red and blue. Uh, gems that you're going to collect during the game are square and opaque, so they actually stand out from the other ones. And again, they're nice plastic. The game even comes with a plastic tray for protecting the miniatures and some of the other components. So not really an insert, but a helper. Yeah, just a little extra box. Like most of the rest of the game's boards. So you put all the boards in, then just toss this tray on top. So so the components are great. What is the game all about? All right. So the overall thing of theme of Sanctum is basically the plot of the Diablo series of games that this is obviously inspired by. You start off in a village and you go out and kill wave after wave of demons attempting to improve your gear, learn new skills in order to breach the walls of Sanctum and fight the demon lord. Every monster you kill lets you advance your skills, and every kill also gives you a new piece of equipment. Now, while this sounds like it could be cooperative, it is not. The winner in this game is the player who manages to survive with the most life, or the player who manages to do the most damage to the Demon Lord if no one surprise, survives. So a very Euro multiplayer solitaire with big scary demons. So how is Sanctum played? All right, this is a this is a heavier one from Check Games Edition. It's what you'd expect from them. So this is going to be a bit of a more of an overview than our usual uh, walkthrough on how to play. But this will give you the general idea. So there's four different characters that are all very different from each other. Everyone's got a unique set of nine skills where not even a single one of those overlap that can be unlocked during play. The two main resources of the game are stamina and focus, and you're going to start with a varying amount of those. These are represented by red and blue pools on the character board and totally going to remind the Diablo players of your health and mana. To start with two gold D6s, you're going to place a third one that they can earn later because this is a dice rolling game. Yeah, so specifically Diablo 2 is where the inspiration really seems to sort of uh, line up most uh, mostly in uh, this game. Now, once player orders determined, characters get some starting stuff. 
uh, either potions or the ability to level up some skills, depending on how far they are from first player. Uh, I thought a neat mechanic in this is the potions are two-sided, so you've got your, your red stamina side and your blue focus, and you flip it like a coin to see what you start with. I thought that was neat. No, people aren't always fans of randoms, but that's a nice, cute little uh, way, way to use randomness in your game. Yeah, I liked it. Now, the game does come with six two-sided game boards, and the number used is based on the number of players, using all six with four and cutting it down as you have less. You lay your first two boards out, you shuffle all the cards, cards, you put them in their proper place, and you're ready to play. Now, each turn, players are going to pick between three things, move, fight, or rest. Now, at the start of the game, you're going to have to move because there's nothing to fight yet. Uh, and then once you've got something to fight, you can fight, but there's no reason to rest because you haven't actually fought anything yet. So it's kind of neat that there's this little progression. And what I love about this as a game teacher is that it's good for just starting play because all I need to teach you is how to move. Okay, now that you've moved and have monsters you can fight, now I can teach you how to fight. Now you fought some monsters, I can teach you how to rest. I like that I don't have to front load all of that. Right, and we've we've discussed a lot recently how ramping up is just that fantastic way to really help games be more beginner-friendly. Mm -hmm. Now, moving, really simple. Move your character to the front of the line. The board's just a bunch of circles and a progression line. There's no choices. You just move to the front of the line. If you're already in the front, you move up one spot, and you spawn monsters. These come from decks of Hobbit-sized cards. They come in three levels, one, two, and three. There are also three colors of monsters, red, blue, and green. And each monster also has a type of loot that it'll drop, and that's also shown on the card. You're going to put these out in pairs or single monsters, depending on what it says on the board. Then, after laying them out, you're going to pick one to confront, and you're going to pick either a group of, uh, like a pair, if there's a pair or a single monster, and you put it on your player board. Now, note this, you get to pick what you're fighting. This is a, the, one of the first indicators of how much of a Euro this game is, because this is a tough choice, because you have to take into account the monster level, the number of monsters you're taking, what dice they need based on the equipment you have, what color they are, because the color they are affects which skills you're going to get to level up, and well, then which items they might drop, because that matters too. Now, in addition to this, at the end of each board is a treasure chest. And this is like a little bonus thing. And it's a reward for the first player to get the end of the board. You take all the monsters that are on the board already and flip the word to the treasure side and everyone gets to pick one. But it's in the order players are on the board. So it's kind of important to keep progressing instead of just staying back and fighting all the time. You kind of want to get further ahead so you don't lose out on the good loot. Um, finally, there are a couple spots twice throughout the game. You're going to unlock more dice. I'm not going to bother getting into the details of how or where, but just know that as the game goes on, you earn more dice. And more dice means more pips to use against the monsters you're fighting. Yeah, exactly. Now, fighting has you battle the monsters you've already drafted. So, of course, you can't fight until you've drafted some. Now, each monster is going to show one, two, or three dice on their cards, depending on what level they are. And they also show a number of blood drops at the bottom, and that's the damage they'll do if they're not defeated. It's really simple here. You roll your dice and match the numbers on the monster cards. If the dice match, you killed the monster. Now, if the dice don't match, this is where your equipment comes into play. You can then use your equipment to uh, modify the die rolls. You have seven different equipment slots, five which start with basic equipment. The rest you have to fill with stuff you kill from monsters. And each spot on the equipment board will let you spend stuff from your stamina pool or your focus pool for some benefit. And those are usually modifiers to the die rolls, whether it's adding or subtracting pips. Each character also has a rage ability. This lets you set one die to a side. It's very powerful, but the only way to get your rage back is to fight a fight where you can't use all your dice. So your character's in rage because they couldn't kill all the monsters. Right. So while in essence, the game is do damage, get stuff, do more damage, repeat. There's so much more to it that because of these choices, which mm -hmm. may not even be obvious uh, when you when you're just looking at this monster bashing game, but take what is a simple concept and evolve it into so much more. Yeah. And what would really impress me about that is basically you're playing Roll For It or King of the Dice, but then there's so much more to it with all the equipment being able to modify your dice. Now, if there's monsters left, so you've spent all your dice, because you only start with two dice, and if you've picked up three monsters, you're not going to be able to kill them all, you take damage. And what you're going to do is look at all the blood drops that are on the card still left in your little monster area and take damage based on how many there are. Now, you again can use your equipment. Now, armor is usually what has these boots, helmet, and chest plate, and you spend focus or stamina to reduce the damage you took. If you go to zero health, though, you are knocked out of the game. And I'm guessing you don't get to respawn back at town on this one. 
No, but I will say it's not easy to die. You probably aren't going to die until the last fight. It's pretty easy to mitigate damage unless you play terribly. Like if you just, I'm going to grab all the monsters. Now I have seven monsters and I'm going to use my two dice to fight. Like, unless you, like, you got to play bad to, to, to fail that quickly in the game. So once you killed your monsters, you're going to get your rewards. Uh, besides having a shiny new piece of equipment for your character, each demon killed lets you level up your skills. And here's where the color coding goes in. If you kill a red monster, you get to level up your red skills. If you kill a green monster, you level up your green skills. Um, the way that works is you move gems up on the cards that represent your skills. And if ever the card has no gems on it, you, get, you earn that skill. This would make a lot more sense if you could see it. So I'm not going to get into more details here. Gems eventually will reach the top of the track. You then use those for equipping gear, which I'll get to in the next action. Equipping happens during resting. When you rest, the first thing you do is you get all your stamina and focus back. So you get your, your pools back. So they come off your equipment, and then you get to equip. Now, each piece of gear equipped does require you to spend gems that are unlocked while leveling up your skills. And again, you got that color thing going on. So green monsters drop green gear that require green gems to use. You can only equip one piece of gear in each of your seven slots. After equipping, any excess gear can be traded to the bank for potions. You get the pick your side this time. You don't flip them. Every character can hold four potions. Potions are used during a fight, but before you roll the dice to move focus and stamina back. So if you've got like your dagger and it's already filled up all the slots on it, you could spend a couple potions to free that up for the next fight. Now, can you hold on to extra excess gear to trade later if you're going to get more than the four potions you're allowed to hold? Yes, you can. You, your, your pack can hold any number of items in this game. So there's, that's, there's no that's way inventory. better than Diablo already. Then. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I see. No, I, I guess they assume you have a town portal and you go back to town and you leave piles all over the city because that's what I used to. In that's Diablo. Diablo 1, yeah. That's Diablo 1, yeah. See, I, I played a lot more Diablo 1 than 2. I did play 2. But yeah, you can hold on to it. One of the things players, it takes a bit to convince people to do is use your potions. Like, don't save them because you're going to get way more gear than you need, which is very much a Diablo aspect of this game. Yeah. Now, at the end of each action, you do this thing where you check to see if you unlock achievements. I don't know if there's achievements in Diablo, but it's very much a video game thing. Uh, you get these for being the first character to do something, whether it's unlock a certain number of gems, learn a certain number of skills, or equip a certain amount of gear. These are bonuses that you use during the final battle. So whoever can own more, more of these is going to have more of an advantage when you get to the final fight. The game continues like this until you get to the Gates of Sanctum, and then the game changes a bit. At this point, the only thing you can do now is fight and rest because there's no more movement. You've gotten to the end and you're going to keep going in turns until someone has defeated all the monsters on the board they've collected. At that point, the demon lord appears. At this point, the players have an option. They can, what they call, answer the call and they can give up the demons that are left on their board, ignore them and get ready to fight the main fighter. They can stay back to fight the monsters they still have. But every time they do that, more horrible things that ha will happen to them before the fight. And what these are is they call them the Demon Lord's Rage Cards. And every player is going to face two of these. And then if anyone stayed back, they're going to face another one. And if anyone stayed back a third round, they're going to face another one of these. And these are horrible. Like, they really are bad. They are terrible. They're like, do this horrible thing that ruins your character or spend one life. And that's and and every one of them's like that. It's like, all right, that one's okay, fine. I'll never get to use this dagger ever again. Okay, lose all your potions or lose one life. Like they're terrible. Right. So you better hope you got it right, folks, because it's gonna be a very bumpy ride once you get to that end. Yeah, because the one thing you've got at this point is you get one last chance to rest. So after this rage has gone off, after you've dealt with all the horribleness and possibly lost some health. You're done. You you rest once more and you rearrange your equipment. You don't get to do anything new. No new skills, no new equipment, nothing changes for the rest of the game at this point. Now, once we get to the actual final fight, this is played out uh, by each player individually, and you can actually do this simultaneously. You take your player board, you've wiped most of the stuff off it because all your skills and that don't matter anymore. You don't need your equipment. All that's gone. Well, your equipment you have, sorry, your, your, your pack full of stuff you've collected is gone. You set out five Demon Lord cards and four Fury cards. And it's like Demon Lord Fury, Demon Lord Fury. You then put your miniature on the first Demon Lord card and you start the fight. Now, these Demon Lord cards each show two dice on them. So they're just like the rest of the monsters. But you're fighting all of the face-up cards at once. So at this point, you are looking at five face-up cards, each of which require two dice and do two damage. So if you get past the first, if you don't get past the first one, if you don't get past the one, you're taking 10 damage right then and there. 
Now, after you defeat a Demon Lord card, you're going to flip those Fury cards. These, again, give you those hard choices again. The, like, lose a die for the rest of the fight or take a health. Never use your armor again or take a health. Like, and then they have more dice to defeat. So you got to defeat the Furies and defeat the Demon and then defeat another Fury, then defeat the Demon. And they do damage and money. The Furies do three. It's horrible. It's just terrible. And, and to make things even harder, during the first two rounds of this fight, you flip up two of those Demon Rage cards at the end of the round and more horrible things happen to you. And just as a heads up, watch that rule. We totally missed the fact that the Demon Rage happens between rounds. We just sat there and did our own little thing because they said you can play simultaneously. It's play out one round, Demon Roars, play out one round, Demon Roars. Okay, we don't have to worry about the roar again. Right. Now, the final battle, as you can tell, is just not easy. Like, like not once in any of the games I've played has every character made it to the end. Now, the winner, though, is the last person standing with the most health. And if that didn't happen, it's the one that got the furthest when battling the Demon Lord. All right, well, now we have a pretty good idea of how this game works. What did you actually think of it? All right, this is, I got to say, exactly what I expected from Check Games Edition. This is a game that takes what should be a pretty simple theme and turns it into a pretty heavy brain burning Euro. Like, I, I, I'm going to start calling this Dungeon Lords Effect because that was the first game I saw this with CGE. And, and like, Pulsar is another one. Well, Pulsar didn't look that late to start off. But, like, they, they seem to put out a lot of games. They're like, oh, uh, Adrenaline. Oh, it's a first-person shooter of the board game. Whoa, this is way more complicated than I thought it would be. This is not what I think people are going to expect, right? They're going to see this, and it's a dice Diablo game. It's probably, they're going to think it's like this, roll your dice, roll your dice, fighting waves and waves of baddies, this real-time game where you're going to get more stuff and flip over the baddies and collect your stuff and roll more dice, which actually kind of sounds kind of cool. I'd probably play that, but that's not what this is. This is a strategy based game with some tactics but really strategy heavy that's all about resource management and optimization like starting from the first turn of the game you're going to be looking at your skills and trying to decide what you want to unlock first and using that to figure out what monsters you want to take on and then making sure you draft the appropriate monsters for the skills you want but also remembering to take into consideration what types of gear you want to find because you don't want to necessarily take those monsters because you don't need two sets of boots on the first turn and every time i've taught sanctum it's had those eureka moments we've talked about before where, where you realize that like you, you could sit here. You could just be like, yeah, okay, I take those monsters and be like, oh, that one dropped the sword. Yeah, I should have realized that it has a sword on it. And you could do it and you could play through the game. You probably won't do that well. And to play well, every choice needs to be considered in relation to where you are at the time and where you plan to go. And there's those eureka moments of realizing that the oh wait the color of the monster matters that's a, that's a pretty one that usually happens pretty early oh the symbol on the monster matters oh wait these monsters all need threes having three monsters that need threes when i have gear that sets dice to four is probably not a good plan i should have drafted monsters that have fours on them because my dagger lets me set dice to four that it, those kind of eureka moments happen in this Yep. So you're not going to be having uh, multiple armor and weapon sets to swap out as needed, like in a video game here. Choices matter long term, especially when you get to that end game and you've got yeah. no more choices to make. You're stuck with the decisions that got you there. Yes, you are. Now, technically, you can swap out during a rest, but most of the time you're swapping good stuff for better stuff. Right. But I have seen it like if you find something better later, you can swap it out. There's not often I put on something that I got on the first board when I'm on the sixth board. Overall, I think the system is brilliant. Like the, the, the combination of the monster colors, the colors of the skills, the different equipment types, be able to see what's coming. Like even the fact the monster deck is face up so you can see what you're going to spawn when you move, so you know exactly what's going to be up there. It is all really well balanced, and my, I, I am so glad that I didn't design this game. Like, I would hate to see the amount of playtesting that went into balancing this game. As for being a good board game representation of Diablo, I think Sanctum does a really good job of recreating parts of Diablo. Like what you're not going to find here is that dexterity element, the clicking element, the, the reactions, the real time, the stress of being swarmed by tons of enemies. That's not what this is. This is a deliberate thinky game that rewards planning and thinking things through over fast action. What I found did remind me the most about Diablo 
was trying to pick what the fight in hopes of getting the right thing. Like, oh, I really need a better weapon. So specifically picking enemies that drop weapons in order to find one. And then every rest phase made me think of Diablo because having to sit there and optimize my skill gems with my equipment to get the most out of it, like that right combination of gear, that felt very much like Diablo to me. Right. So grindy, but thinky grindy, as opposed to just wandering around a field until the right drop happens to occur. Yeah, then there's no legendary items or any super rare items in the deck that you're trying to find either. Now, my one complaint I do have about this game is that paradigm shift between the main game and the boss battle. Because you spend the entire game gearing up for the main battle, but then the battle feels different somehow from the rest of the game. Like, in actuality, you're still doing the same thing. You're still rolling your dice to match the numbers on the cards to kill cards. But just you're not learning new stuff. You're no longer grabbing gear. You're not getting a reward for it. You're not building your character. It's just rolling a bunch of dice and using your existing stuff to the best of your ability. And, and like, that doesn't even sound that different. But trust me, when you play it, it just feels like a different part of the game. Yeah, I think the, the, real, the real sort of disconnect is it stops being a Euro. Um, and, and just becomes a dice chucker at that point because you, you've run out of options. There are, you don't have branches. There aren't mm -hmm. choices that will affect things in any real way. It's all about the dice and then whether or not you, you know, give up that armor or take a health point, um, yeah. which isn't the same as the, 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 the collection and the, the seeking out of the, of the different colored gems and, and such along the way. Yeah, I can see that, definitely, especially as you get further along the fight, because eventually you'll have used up all your equipment. You'll have no stamina left, you'll have no focus left, and it gets down to just hoping you roll the right thing. Right. Overall, I, I dig it for what it is. I like Sanctum for what Sanctum is. Knowing it was a CGE game, I knew what to expect. I knew, knew that this was going to be a heavier, more Euro-style game. My biggest worry for this one is that people are going to pick it up expecting one thing and get another. They're going to expect a, a fast and furious uh, monster smashing game that is an aspect of Diablo and it's not. Now, I do think this is a very cool board game adaptation of games like Diablo, but if what you want is the hacking and slashing, you're not going to find it. Like, yes, you kill some demons, but it's all about spending dice. You're going to have a dice that, game that's mostly about planning ahead and randomness mitigation and having the tools to modify the dice and managing your resources while very deliberately planning your next move and advancement, uh, figuring out your advancement path and just all for one big fight, one big dice fest in the end and trying to get the most modifiers, the most bonuses, the most dice, the most extra stamina, the most potion, like just preparing for that fight. Due to this, I don't think this is for everyone in any way, shape, or form. Like, not even Diablo fans. Like, I, I'd love to be able to say, if you're a Diablo fan, pick up this. I don't think it's it, it's that kind of game. I do think it's a very solid game for people who like Dice Space Euros. And in that case, I don't think it matters if you know or care about Diablo at all. I think the mechanics stand on their own. So for a more in-depth look at Sanctum from CGE, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews this episode we take a look at a, the exotica expansion for the deck building card game eminent domain one note before we start we were provided with a review copy of this expansion from tasty minstrel games uh, eminent domain exotica was designed by seth jaffe uh, this is the original designer of eminent domain itself and feature features art from eric j carter and ariel sioni was published in 2016, so this is definitely not the new hotness tonight. For a good look at what you get with this expansion, be sure to check out our unboxing video on YouTube. All right, as this is an expansion, I think people are going to care what you get in the box. You do get a slew of new stuff for Eminent Domain. We're looking at 31 new technology cards, 27 new planets, four new starting planets, nine scenarios, new fighter tokens, a whole new resource and counters for it, uh, as a nice bonus touch stickers for all of the resources, including the ones in the original game. Now, that's just the stuff for Exotica. What's also in here is a bonus pack of more cards that are only meant to be used if you're playing it with uh, the Escalation expansion for Eminent Domain. And this includes even more technologies, planets, and scenario cards. Like, overall, I was really impressed. This is a small little box. It is packed. There is a lot of nice stuff in here. 
as for quality, everything matches up with the original. I have no complaints. Nothing really stuck out as awesome, but there was definitely nothing wrong. And one of the scenario rules is even called hipster. So you can enjoy your overpriced latte with your controlling of the galaxy. <laughs> now, the big thing added by this expansion to eminent domain are uh, asteroids and the ability to mine them and the new exotic keyword source type that goes with that. Almost all of the new components here, like pretty much all of them. I, I didn't check to see if every card references them, but as far as I can tell, it's most of the new text and all of the new planets feature these new gameplay elements. So everything in here is asteroids and mining or exotic. Now I'm going to start off by talking about the asteroids and mining. So asteroids are a new planet type. They're in the planet deck. They're easy to colonize or conquer. Every single one is a 3-3. In addition to having these new things there's a new action included which is um if anyone has exotica it's like having the new warfare action that where you can use your ships and this is an action called mining what it lets you do is you can discard your entire hand to flip over an asteroid to colonize it quote unquote that's considered mining now basic mining can also be upgraded but in that's by using a research action you spend three knowledge and you get to flip over the card you have for um Mining, you have advanced mining. What it does is it makes all asteroids cost one less, whether that's colony or ship. Right. And now one thing that I, I did note elsewhere uh, in other discussions of this, mining doesn't let you draw another asteroid card. It just lets you flip over flip. the existing asteroid card. And I, I noticed that was a mistake I saw huh. in some other reviews and teaches. So Interesting. I wonder how people... I, we definitely didn't make that mistake ourselves. So if, if they if they possibly updated the rule book in the printing I have, I don't know. I think it was just was a little confusion. bit of confusion, uh, confusion with how things were I mean, when they were yeah. going through it. But. No, it lets you flip over the asteroids you have. It basically yeah. lets you colonize them. So colonizing the asteroid, why would you do it? And the thing is, it, it, you don't. there's no immediate good reason to because most aren't that good. They're not worth in points at the end of the game. They're not giving you a lot of resources that just not as good as the planets. So you're like, wow, these don't do anything at all until you start looking through the new technology cards. Cause many of these new technology cards do something based on the number of asteroids you have that are mined. As an example, there's the asteroidal colonies card that gives you one colony symbol for every mined asteroid you have in play. Can you imagine how powerful that is? Like you can take a six planet in one turn if you've got six mined asteroids and play with this. Or the asteroidal warfare card, which gives you one fighter and lets you attack one planet for every mined asteroid you have in play. And that's just two cards out of many. Yeah, and it really does seem that once you understand these new tech cards, hoarding asteroids is a perfectly strong tactical choice to make. Yes, and added to that, there are also technologies that let you get more asteroids. Not by that one technology, but technology cards that actually like let you search the deck and go until you find an asteroid. So that's the asteroid stuff. Next comes the exotic stuff. Now, this is a little more complicated. So there's a few things going on here. So first off, there's a new exotic symbol, which looks like all the other role symbols. And it kind of looks like General Grievous from Star Wars. And I think it's supposed to represent like ancient aliens. Now, there's also a new planet type. By adding a new planet type to the game, they actually threw in a whole new technology deck just for that planet type. Note this planet type does not work for any of the previous combos, like where you needed two different types of planets. These don't count. You still have to stick to the originals. Now, here's where it gets odd. The exotic planets don't actually generate exotic symbols, even though they have them on the top, but they all have an arrow next to them, and they're exotic translators is the way it's worded. And what it lets you do is convert your exotic symbols to one of the standard role symbols. So you might be able to convert your exotic symbols to colonize or explore. The thing is, they don't give you any. To get actual exotic symbols, you have to buy some of these new exotic technologies that come on that new tech deck. Plus, there's some mixed in the other decks. Once you have some and a planet with a converter, like two or three exotic symbols become really powerful. Like they almost become wild cards in your deck, depending on the number of converters you have. Now, thematically, I thought it was neat because I thought this worked. It represents alien technology that you don't understand. And the more technology cards you have that are exotic, the more you understand and can use the technology. Now, along with some of this, there are also um, technology cards that are like the asteroid cards where you get something for every exotic symbol you have. So it does that similar to the asteroids. Right. And there's, an, as a nice little note, they differed the exotic symbols slightly so that some have a red outline and some don't, which is specifically to help end game scoring where the different card types, even though they might all have exotic cards, some mm -hmm. of them don't actually count towards victory points. 
Yeah, one of the things they've done to balance the game uh, is some of these exotic cards give you negative victory points based on how many of them you have. So if you focus too much on the alien technology, you actually lose points because it is really powerful. And that's where those red and the yellow symbols come in. Uh, now we also have a new resource. It's called Crystal. And what's nice is they put a nice green see-through pieces. So they're actually, instead of the wood, they look like crystal. I thought that was a nice touch. Uh, these are usually only found on the exotic worlds. These work exactly the same as any other resource. Though they're harder to find, they don't count for cards that say any resource. Now what this did do is it lets cards that are like when you trade in, get a bonus point for each resource type you have. So what it did is it, it helped balance the existing buying and selling strategies by giving some added bonus to that, which I actually thought was a welcome change. Yeah, it's interesting because while a lot of what these expansions do is add new directions you can go in, they have mm. also in, in, in various ways with each expansion tweaked original uh, concepts just a little yeah. bit to help make them either more viable or or less overpowering or whichever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for example, I would say that Escalation fixes Warfare as a strategy. It, it definitely makes Warfare more viable. This part of this expansion makes trade and buying and selling more viable, makes the a trade strategy. Now, along with this, there are some minor rule tweaks and additions that I don't really want to get into because they're just like minutia. Like there's resources that replenish every round. There are some new scenario cards. Uh, note you would... The scenario rules were actually included in Escalation. They do replete them here. Now, Escalation came with a deck of scenarios. There's like nine new ones in here. It's basically that there are nine new ones that use these new things. Um, there's some diverse technologies that use all three original planet types. Note, again, original, the exotics don't count. Again, this was something that was added in Escalation, but repeated here. Um, basically nothing, just little things, minutia and little details and cards that let you see, search through the deck or put things on the top of decks or whatever. Right. Now, I did mo mention Escalation quite a few times here. You do need to own or use Escalation to use Exotica. It is perfectly viable and valid on its own. Right. And there was a little glitch there, so that's you do not need to own i think in case that uh that glitch comes through on the audio you do not need to own yes. that uh escalation uh replenishing was added in escalation but they keep reintroducing it in the later expansions so that you don't have to understand have have the escalation mm -hmm. uh or or any of the other expansions yep now as for my thoughts on this expansion for eminent domain i like it um what i like the most about these two new features the asteroids and the exotic symptoms is that they're multi-step process. It's not, uh, you get a thing. Like to actually get anything out of them, you have to do a series of actions. For example, you need to get the asteroids, you need to mine them, and then you need to find a technology that will put those mined asteroids to use. Mm -hmm. Similarly with the exotic worlds, having one does nothing. You, you have a converter for converting nothing. It takes building your deck with a focus on exotic technologies in order to actually cash in on that. And I, there's something about that that just feels sci-fi, like feels 4X, feels like space exploration. I love that multi-step process. It feels good. Yeah, no, indeed, they really open up new paths as opposed to just adding something new to slip into an existing strategy. Then when combined with roles, the replayability and our scenarios, the replayability and potential of this game is really powerful. Now, the problem with this, because there's always got to be a problem, right, is the same one I've stated in every eminent domain review we do and every time we talk about actual plays and our weekend review, and that is the learning curve. This expansion tosses in a lot of new elements at once, and it's not modular. Like, you can't just use the mining, and you probably could if you actually went through your deck and pecked and choose, but, like, it's, it's designed to use all of it or none of it. And then added to it, the interaction of these elements is not obvious. Like, I basically explained how you progress your way through with, you get asteroids, you mine them, you use them. There's nothing in the game that teaches you that. We had to figure it out. Like we had to sit there going, okay, what am I doing with these asteroids? Why, why do I even want these? And then later, once I've got a couple other planets up and I get to get a tech going through the tech get going, oh, wait, this is asteroid. Oh, wait. And like, there's this discovery, right? And, and that was totally what it was like. Like they're not that good. And it wasn't until studying the research and the technology deck that the actual advantages of these new uh, strategies became evident. Right. I, I think a quick strategy guide would actually be a fantastic adder to the game just to give new players an idea about why they would want to use this new thing so they mm -hmm. don't trip over the potential completely by accident. No, I agree. I could see that, though. Then you lose that discovery moment, that eureka moment of figuring it out yourself. So, 
you, you would take that away from players if he did give them the strategy. Though I, I do think um, they, there is a giant foldout in this with all the tech tree in it. Yes. And if you were to be the kind of player who liked to go through and analyze tech trees, mm -hmm. you would figure this out before the game. But that's a lot to expect for most players. Again, yeah, <laughs> that's a lot to ask, right? Because because once you do, once you take the time to learn the new technology cards, whether that's studying the tech tree or um, during play, and, and how everything interacts with each other. There is a lot to like here. It's just getting over that hill, like getting over that hurdle that, that just not everyone's going to want to do that. Though I got to say at this point, this is the second expansion for this game. And unless you bought everything at once, you're probably pretty invested in eminent domain and already have some skill and are used to doing these connections. You're probably inclined to get over that learning curve. Yeah, and I think it's a little less scary if you've already been through it once. So if you picked up Excalation mm -hmm. and you, you've you already dealt with that, oh, look, here's a whole bunch of new stuff that's all jammed in there. You know it'll be bumpy for the first couple of games, and then you'll catch on, and yep. you'll enjoy all these new opportunities. Now, having played it a good number of times and playing around with these new elements, I'm pleased to say that these the, the strategies that are evident in this both seem very valid, right? Like, as a unique, standalone um, games, we've had someone just try to do exotic do alien tech and i've seen a game where someone played just like asteroid heavy just getting every asteroid they possibly can and that that both worked um as well as combining them right like so having a colonized strategy with asteroids on the side or working on exotics while doing a trade strategy which works particularly well with that new element um what we did find was difficult is it didn't seem like you could just do exotic ads because you're looking at two different types of planets you're trying to collect if you do that. So that didn't seem totally valid, though I think it might work. Uh, what I did like, too, is a lot, is you could ignore it. You could, if you like here, if you have a strategy for playing Eminent Domain and you like to play a heavy colonization strategy, this expansion is not going to ruin that colonization strategy for you. Now, there are going to be new planet types, you might need to find something to mitigate so that you can go through the deck a little quicker. But overall, we never found that the old strategy stopped working, which I really liked. Now, of course, this is eminent domain. So what works best is not just going to be based on what you want to do. It's going to be what planets come up, what other players are doing, what roles come around, what, especially what roles the other characters pick, because the whole descent or draw thing is if you can get another player to do the work for you maybe you do want to colonize a lot because man sean's going to colonize thing he's going to keep colonizing so that's going to let me flip more asteroids i guess i'll ignore my original exotic strategy that's eminent domain for you yeah again those those roles those scenarios based with the combined with the wealth of strategic directions that are available and expanding with every expansion makes this the replayability of this game just huge yeah yeah, definitely the rules. The scenarios are something different. Scenarios are a game setup thing. It's the, the rules you take as you're playing are, are the big push here. Like overall, I got to say, if you play Eminent Domain, get this. There, if you don't have it yet, which is, I, I feel like I'm probably preaching to the choir. I don't know how many people, now that it's um it's four years after this has come out, but if you've been considering it, I, I would pick this up. Like I actually prefer this one to Escalation. I felt I got more new options without changing the feel of the game because Escalation really did put a focus on warfare and collecting ships and trading ships for technology that changed the feel of the game where it's not. That said, this plays really well with just the base game and just as well with Escalation. So you can go either way. Now, if you're not an eminent domain fan, you probably aren't listening to this right now, but if you are, uh, this doesn't do anything to change the original. So there's nothing here to make eminent domain more appealing to a broader audience it's it's not doing anything new that would draw new people in right well for a more in-depth look at eminent domain exotica you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews and now the Te bellhops tabletop where we take a look back and summarize what's happened since we were last year what games hit our tables yeah, every week we like to take this look back at the games we played and the events we attended and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. Now, most of what we played this last week were games we've already talked about during the game review segment, so I'm going to skip over those and move right on to Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Uh, last Friday, Deanna and I played the first non-tutorial scenario, number six, finally getting to play with the full rules and the training wheels off. 
Thankfully, the eagle-eyed guy in the chair joined us once more. Thank you to Mugen for all your help. As always. Uh, the biggest problem with Gloomhaven and even Jaws of the Lion, despite being simpler and streamlined, is there's just so much to keep track of. Like, we're really good at understanding the cards and the AI and the rules, but it's things like remembering that some monsters cause status effects, which is only on their monster card, and remembering which effects are in play and, and changing the elements every round and remembering to remove status effects at the end of people's turns and remembering when to shuffle the decks. And it's all those little things. Yeah, it's a game with a lot going on. And really, the more eyes, the better, as it's really simple to miss even just one little thing like a status effect. When, and when that status effect started and stopped working, that can drastically change things in a chain effect yes. from that point. Like this is actually the biggest advantage, disadvantage I've found playing with just two players is you don't have four sets of eyes on the game to catch things. And again, I got to shout out. Thank you to Mujin for catching our mistakes last Friday. Yeah, absolutely. All right, starting tomorrow, we are going to try a new feature for our actual play recordings. I've, I'm hoping it'll work. We are going to throw up a second camera. Now, sadly, we're not going to be able to get this camera on the stream. So those of you joining live aren't going to get the benefit from this. But I am hoping to be able to include footage of it on the YouTube version of the, of the actual play and all future actual plays. Now... We are working on multi-camera stream option, but that's going to take a bit more time and, well, more technology, to be honest. We have the cameras. It's more a, a matter of uh, USB ports more than anything else. Well, if it all goes to plan, it'll still be a couple of weeks before that particular episode makes it onto YouTube. But we'll try and let people know. And as always, if you're subscribed to our YouTube channel, hit that bell to find out first. Also, remember you can join us live Friday nights at 8.30 p.m. Toronto, New York time at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and watch these actual plays unfold live where you can hang out with myself, Temujin, and whoever else is dropping by that week where we can keep things a little more active even if the players are busy staring at their cards trying to figure out what happens <laughs> yeah. next. Yeah, that's, that's the reason to add the other cameras. There's the downtime of trying to pick what to do I realize is not great for video. All right, there's one more game I think it's worth talking about quickly, and that's Corridor. Um, ever since it came up in the lobby, our chat room, during our talk about games that were more than we expected, games that surprised us, uh, I found Corridor on Board Game Arena, and it looks exactly like the actual physical game, and I invited Sean to play, and we played a number of games on Board Game Arena, and I got to strongly recommend it. If you like Corridor, check this out, and if you don't, if you don't know it, it might be a way to try it. Now, I know you hadn't even heard of Corridor before, boating this up and i gotta say is this not just like a simple but really brilliant game it is it's it there's nothing to it you either move one pawn like one chess pawn or place a little two square long board to block a somewhere on the board that's it nothing else it. you got to get to the other side yep that's just your goal get your pawn, move your to, pawn the other to the side. opposite side and the only other rule is you can't cut off the entire board. Right. So you can't stop the person. You, you cannot prevent them from ever yes. getting to the other side. It is so good. You only get 10 walls. That's a big aspect of it. It is such a brilliant, simple, like soon as someone mentioned that in the chat, I'm like, oh, that deserves to be on this list. Because that is a game you just look at and go, what is this? And then you yeah. play it like, oh my God, you want to talk about a cutthroat two player game that you're like, no, oh, I totally didn't see that. Yeah. It's well, and I mean, it's limited choices, right? So, you know, you can, you can do one thing, but there are probably three things you could do to improve your chances or three other things you could do to hurt the other player. And oh, yeah. you've got to, you've got to pick because you've got, you know, only so many options. Uh, and one thing I'm finding with this game, and I don't know um, whether it's, it's, it's us and, and, and our level of play or what, but most of the time you get to a point where, you no, know, this oh, yeah. game is over and we just, someone is going to resign because they can't see the path that takes less maneuvers than the other path. No, I think that's, that's been a corridor aspect of the game since the beginning. Right. Eventually you get to the point, especially once both players have played all their walls, it's like, I, I'm going to take me 18 moves to get to the end. It's going to take you 16. You win. There's no right. point in us just moving the pond, especially on board game arena. Yeah. Cause man, in real life, you could just be like, you know, with your hand, it'd be done in minutes, but on board game arena, it's like, all right, I click. <laughs> now I yeah. wait for you. All right, come on. Come on. Yeah. 
come on. All right, now I move, right? Right, especially is because a lot of times, you know, if I'm working and I don't realize you're sitting there playing at the yeah. same time, I'll be doing something and, and I, you'll, a lot of times you'll play a game and move on, whereas mm-hmm. in this game, you've, you've been sitting there playing and I'm like, ah, I had no idea. There were, I had another turn waiting. You're, you're, oh, yeah. uh, I've moved on. And then you don't reply right away, so I leave right. and go do <laughs> something else. But yeah, it's seriously, like, it, it's on Board Game Arena. It's free, I think. Like, I, I don't think you need a premium account to start a game. Nope. It's it's a fantastic game. Corridor, it's spelled weird. It's like Q-U-O-R-E-O-R. Yeah. It's, uh, it's it, awesome. it, like, like, for abstracts, it's up there. Like, Chess Lake abstracts, it's 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 no Duke. Like, it's not going to replace that for me. This is more of a fun, like, it, this should be in every coffee shop. Yes. Like, seriously, it absolutely. should just be in every <laughs> coffee shop everywhere. Except people probably steal the walls or something. Or, or kill each other. You know, <laughs> well, there is that. It, 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 it's the whole game is supposed to be cutthroat. That's the entire yeah. point is to cut off your opponent. Yeah. I want to play more than two players because I've never Ooh, done that. That would be because the wow. other players are going across you. Oh, okay. Wow. Like they're going this way. You're going this way. I didn't way. even realize that was an option. Okay. I don't think it is. I didn't see it on Board Game Arena. Uh, but in the actual version, it's two players are going this way, two players are going this way, and they're affected by everyone's well, balls. Well, yeah. Wow, that'd be crazy. And you can't cut off the other players, too. So well, yeah. No, that's, more of the, yeah. That's, yeah, I want to try it. That's a whole different game. And I, that's a, that that actually I'm more interested in because there there are certain things that are going to happen in a two-player game. Well, yeah. It's, it's, it's after yeah. Well, I, I don't know. There's expert corridor players in tournaments. So I think oh, no, absolutely. It's not, it's not a solved game. It. It's, it's, yeah. nope, I, don't, I don't mean to any, in any way to indicate that it's a solved game, that there's a, a best way to do it. Uh, right now, we're in the walk options. towards each other till we're almost touching, then put a wall stage, but I'm sure right. that'll evolve. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right, so the reviews I have planned for next week. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to guarantee those are going to happen but this is the plan is two of the oldest items on the pile of obligation. We are hammering through that since our review of Palooza, trying to get everything everyone's gotten us to review done in a more timely manner. Not that I think we're failing before, but I just want to get things done a little quicker. Uh, The first is going to be the Orléans expansion trade and intrigue. I have played trade a number of times. I'm a fan of trade. I have not gotten intrigue to the table. This one's going to be tough because I need to play it with people who've never played Orléans before. So it's going to be a matter of teaching Orléans and then teaching intrigue. I don't want to throw it in there right from the start. So I don't know. This, this, I'm hoping to review this next week. We're hoping to get in uh, multiple games this this weekend. And well, Flick Wars, uh, that was supposed to be in the review of Palooza. It just didn't happen. It's a dexterity-based, I would say, miniature game, really. It's a, it's a war game where you're buying units and you're trying to take out the opponent's base. Um, I have reviewed this in the past, but what I reviewed in the past was a print-and-play version. I will be reviewing the actual retail version of Flick Wars. I just got to get um, my daughters to play it with me. <laughs> Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. All right, Duran Barnett. Thanks. Timothy Timothy Smith. Thanks, Timothy. William Fisher. Thank you. Danielle Thomas. Happy belated birthday. Sean P. Kelly. Thanks, Sean. Not from Hamilton or Sean Hamilton. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed and the portcullis is down, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you dig what you've been watching, listening, or uh, I know there's no real reading tonight, but if you uh, maybe you're reading the show notes, be sure to head over to patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop and please consider tipping your bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube every 2 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.